30 on the nose. So we're going to call the meeting to order. First item is uh, Pledge of Allegiance. If you all join me. Okay, roll call, please. Eva Henry. Steve Odoricio. Present. Jeff Baker. Here. Elise Jones. Here. David Beacom. Here. Randy Wheelock. Sean Wood. Chrissy Fanganello. Anthony Graves. Here. Robin Kanich. Here. Roger Partridge. Here. Gail Watson. Libby Zabo. Here. Bob Pfeiffer. Here. Bob Roth. Here. Larry Vidham. Here. David Spellman, Aaron Brockett, Here. Ann Justin, Here. Lynn Baca, Here. Tara Radloff, <laughs> Jeff Blue, George Teal, Jason Bauer, Here. Doris Trular, Here. Laura Christman, Here. Richard Champion, Gail Christie, Rick Teeter, Here. Debbie Nasta, Here. Steve Conklin, Here. Joe Jefferson, Steve Yates, Jeff Deacon. Here. Daniel Dick. Present. Lisa Jones. Laura Brown. Lynette Kelsey. Here. Scott Norquist. Storm Glore. Saoirse Karras Graves. Casey Brown. Here. Ron Mikowski. Present. Mike Hillman. Brad Weasley. Stephanie Walton. Shakti. Dana Gutwein. Here. Jerry Bean. Isaac Levy. Phil Sernanik. Bruce Beckman. Wynn Shaw, Here. Joan Peck, Here. Gabe Santos, Here. Ashley Stolzman, Here. Connie Sullivan, Dan Greenberg, Here. Colleen Whitlow, <clears throat> Deborah Jerome, Sean Foray, Chris Larson, Kyle Mullica, Here. John Dyack, Here. Sally Daigle, Here. <clears throat> Rita Dozal, Here. Heidi Williams, Here. Herb Atchison, Here. Joyce Jay, Here. Adam Zarin, Deborah Perkins Smith, Bill Van Meter. Here. And we have a quorum. And yeah, we do have a quorum. We have uh, several new people here this evening that I want to recognize. <clears throat> First of all, from uh, Lions, the alternate from Lions, Dan Greenberg is here. We have a brand new Dr. Cog uh, entity that's Castle Pines. Tara Radloff and Jeff Blue, when we did the uh, roll call, neither one of them are here this evening, but they're a new member. And then we have uh, Isaac Levy from Larkspur, new alternate. I think, was he not here when you called? Okay. And then Wynn Shaw is officially the member from Lone Tree now, and Jackie Malay is the alternate. We have Catherine Whitman, who's the alternate from Decono. And Jason Bauer, who's the alternate from Castle Rock. Did I miss anybody? Very good. So I have a motion to approve the agenda. Have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstain? We have a public hearing tonight that you may have heard about. And uh, staff is kind enough to give me a script. So <laughs> that's a good thing. Uh, so good, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Bob Roth, the chair of the Denver Regional Council of Governments. I thank you all for coming tonight. This evening, the Denver Regional Council of Governments is holding a public hearing on the proposed 2040 Metro Vision Regional Transportation Plan and the 2018 through 2021 Transportation Improvement Program and the associated air quality conformity uh, detrimination. What is that? Oh, determination, determination documents. Boy, I should have read it a little closer. <laughs> This, this public hearing of the Denver Regional Council of Governance is hereby convened. The purpose of this hearing is to provide an opportunity for all those who are interested 
in the documents I just noted to provide comments to the board. No decisions will be made and no actions will be taken tonight related to this public hearing. Receiving public comment is important to the board's decision making process. Anyone wishing to speak should have either registered on the sign in sheets that were out on the uh, reception area table or should have previously made a request to speak through the Dr. Cog website or by phone. All comments received via email, Dr. Cog website, or in writing have been automatically included in the public hearing record. Comments received prior to this public hearing have been provided to the board. If you wish to submit written, written testimony to be included in the official record of the public hearing, please give it to Connie after you speak. Board members are free to ask questions of those who are testifying. Jacob Rieger and Todd Cottrell of Dr. Cog staff will now summarize the proposed documents. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the board. Uh, I'm Jacob Rieger. I'm our Long Range Transportation Planning Manager at Dr. Cog. Uh, before getting into the presentation, just one sort of housekeeping item uh, that our chair mentioned. Um, so we've had a public comment period for the last 30 days. This is the 30th day, and the public comment period ended at 5 o'clock this evening, culminating in this hearing tonight. Um, during the 30-day or, you know, about 30, at least 30 day public comment period. Uh, we did receive one uh, written comment that was formally submitted to us. Uh, you have that at your seat. Any comments that we receive at this public hearing tonight, we will compile all of them uh, for you when this item uh, comes, or these items come back to you for adoption. So I just wanted to be clear on that. So we have a short uh, presentation from staff just to kind of orient you on, on, on the subject of the public hearing tonight. Uh, really we're talking about uh, sort of two big documents uh, and the air quality that goes with them. Uh, this slide sort of talks about the plan relationships here at Dr. Cog. Uh, this board has spent a long time working on Metrovision plan that you adopted back in January. Um, so as everyone knows, that is our, uh, that is our shared uh, regional aspirational vision. Tonight we're talking about the Metrovision Regional Transportation Plan, uh, which is the blue box here underneath. And as part of that, it includes the fiscally constrained Regional Transportation Plan. So the Metrovision Plan is our long range, uh, 20 plus year, it's our 2040 plan. It talks about what this region, what's our vision for multimodal transportation uh, within the Dr. Cog region. As I said, it includes the fiscally constrained plan, which is what we can actually afford to build uh, by 2040 based on the revenues available. Um, also subject of this public hearing tonight is a transportation improvement program, uh, which is really sort of what we're building right now over the next four years, projects on the ground uh, now and, and in the near term. And so we will give you overviews of each of these documents. So starting with the 2040 Metrovision Regional Transportation Plan, and I don't like to use acronyms, but I will use just one, one or two in this presentation. I want to say MVRTP so I don't repeat those long words over and over. But our 2040 MVRTP, it integrates the transportation component, the transportation theme of Metrovision, along with the fiscally constrained regional transportation plan I spoke about. It shows um, dollars that are allocated, revenues that are allocated uh, to all sorts of projects and project types through 2040. So it shows dollars to maintain our regional transportation system in good condition. Uh, it shows revenues for things like safety, local bus service, sidewalks, all of the things that make up our transportation system. And it shows that either through uh, project type funding categories that are in the plan and the financial tables. And then it also shows uh, revenues for specific capacity uh, projects that federal requirements uh, dictate that we show those individual projects. So it's based on revenues that are expected through 2040 uh, to fund all of those things that I mentioned, maintaining what we have and uh, accommodating for growth in all modes of our transportation. Um, it also, for the major projects that it does individually identify, uh, it also shows uh, staging periods for those projects. Um, I will note, you know, so we have an existing uh, fiscally constrained regional transportation plan that you adopted in 2015. We've amended it a couple times since then. Uh, so the current, the current plan as amended. This version of the plan is really more sort of tying together other threads like Metrovision, you know, greater text, more maps, those sorts of things. But in terms of the actual plan, in terms of dollars or projects, uh, this version has only minor differences from the existing plan that we already have. There are not uh, major uh, changes to projects in this plan, and there are not uh, financial changes in this plan. So I did want to note that. Um, this is a map of the Dr. Cog uh, region. 
a couple different colors on this map, but basically uh, for our transportation, our core transportation planning functions cover the, the counties and portions of counties in green, uh, the seven counties plus Southwest Weld County, uh, but really our, our, our regional planning process, our Dr. Cog uh, planning process covers the entire uh, nine county metro area, again, plus Southwest Weld. Our long range plan, our MVRTP, uh, has several federal requirements and topics uh, that we need to address in this plan. Uh, you see several of the big ones on the screen. I will not go through them individually except to say that they cover a variety of topics that relate to both our transportation planning process, how we conduct transportation planning, as well as specific content things that need to be in this plan. Um, but I've already mentioned the two most important or some of the two most visible uh, federal requirements. So again, fiscal constraint, the idea that whatever is included in our plan, whether it's individual projects or project type categories that we show funding for, that we have the revenues, local, state, and federal revenues uh, to pay for those expenditures by 2040. So we have to balance revenues and costs in the plan, and that's known as fiscal constraint. Uh, the plan and the transportation improvement program are also subject to air quality conformity requirements. Um, I have a slide on that in a minute, but we have to show that both documents meet, um, meet the air quality emissions budgets that are set for this region, and they do. Um, just as a brief overview in the plan, one of the things that we think about is, you know, what are some of the underlying assumptions or issues that we're wrestling with as we conduct our long-range transportation planning? You know, obviously one of the biggest things, you don't need me to tell you this, is how quickly and how much this region is growing. So our latest official projections are that by 2040, this region will add 1.2 million more people, a city the size of Indianapolis, to the Denver region, and over a half a million new jobs to this region. Also in the plan, uh, we talk about every aspect of our transportation system, and I do want to emphasize that. You know, we all think about projects, and projects are certainly in there, but everything that makes up our connected, integrated, multimodal transportation system uh, is covered in this plan. Uh, we have specific elements that are dedicated. We have a transit plan uh, as part of the long-range plan. Uh, we have a freight component. Uh, we have an extensive bicycle and pedestrian uh, component. We have sections that talk about how we operate and manage our transportation system. We talk about technology, safety, uh, security, aviation. All of these topics um, are dealt with narratively, financially, and otherwise within our long-range transportation plan. Um, this is a map of what we call the um, regionally significant uh, capacity projects. This map shows roadway, managed lane, and bus rapid transit capacity projects. Again, this is a federal requirement uh, relating to air quality uh, that we need to individually identify these big ticket capacity projects. So again, remember in the plan, we show buckets of funding for types of projects. You know, again, things like safety, sidewalks, maintenance, all those sorts of things. But these big projects, we actually do identify them individually, uh, both on a map like this as well as in one of the appendices. Uh, similarly, for rapid transit, uh, the fast track system that's uh, fiscally constrained through 2040, uh, as well as a couple bus rapid transit projects that are part of the plan. Uh, you see those on the screen here. Again, these, these big ticket capacity rapid transit projects we also identify individually in the plan. But again, also the plan has funding categories for things like local bus service, uh, specialized transit, Americans with Disabilities Act transit, uh, and all sorts of spectrum of, of um, bus and other types of, of transit service. So my colleague Todd is going to talk about the Transportation Improvement Program, which is the other major document that's the subject of this public hearing. Thank you. Uh, Todd Cottrell, Dr. Cog staff. Uh, so as Jacob mentioned, the Transportation Improvement Program, or TIP, is also part of this public hearing. And this is a federally required document um, covering uh, a short range from fiscal, federal fiscal year 2018 through 2021. And versus the RTP, this is a document and program that identifies real transportation projects with real dollars that is happening currently right now, um, all fiscally constrained um, with federal and state funding. Um, so to break a little bit of practice, over the last um, you know, eight, ten years, Dr. Cog has created a TIP um, every four years with four years of program funding. Uh, we're starting to break that cycle and now to create a TIP every two years, but still keep the call for projects every four years. And this is to better align with the annual um, STIP that CDOT is creating, and the STIP being the uh, statewide transportation improvement program, which is a culmination of only of CDOT projects statewide. So not only does this uh, project contain calls of, 
a previous call for projects from Dr. Cog, but it also contains from our two uh, planning partners, CDOT and RTD. Um, since this uh, our last tip, the 16 tip was updated just two years ago and created then, uh, there was no new Dr. Cog call for projects with this tip. Um, so it's projects that were transferred over from the 16 tip that had funding within um, the 18 to 21 time frame. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, so there, here's a map that contains the um, 18 through 21 tip projects. Uh, again, this is, uh, these are all projects that are laid out uh, according to project type. Finally, as I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, both of these documents are subject to federal air quality conformity requirements. In a nutshell, what that means is that we are required uh, to do analysis on several criteria pollutants and to show uh, that both the plan and the transportation improvement program uh, together, uh, well, each, each document, um, but the projects together, it's, it's based on the entire plan and the entire TIP. Uh, meet federal air quality conformity requirements. So we do air quality conformity modeling for these criteria pollutants. We compare against the emissions budgets that have been established um, and the documentation associated with these with the plan and the TIP uh, show that we pass each of the uh, emissions budget tests for each of the uh, criteria pollutants. And that is our presentation, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. Um, this probably goes without saying, but I did want to point out that the this public comment period is specifically toward this presentation for general comments we do have a public comment period uh, later on in the agenda but this is specifically for these two these two items so the hearing is now open for those who have signed up to speak each speaker will have up to three minutes to testify if you have not finished by the end of three minutes i will ask you to conclude your remarks we, we respectfully ask that you not repeat specific points that are made by prior speakers. A simple statement of agreement with prior testimony is acceptable and appreciated. When you're here, your name called, please approach the microphone at the podium here at the end, end of the table and uh, be prepared to testify as soon as the preceding speaker is finished. So the public comment period is open and the first name I have is Gail O'Toole. Good evening, Mr. Chair and Board and other members. Thank you very much for having us here, and thank you for your service in planning and creating positive growth in the Denver metro region. That said, the reason that I've asked Ms. to speak Ms. this Ms. evening. Yes, sir? Can I ask where you're from? Please? Yes, sir. I'm sorry. I'm, uh, do you want specific address? Greenwood Village in thank general. You. Thank Th you. Thank you very much, sir. That said, the reason that I've asked to speak this evening is that there appears to have been a glaring oversight in both the 2040 Metro Vision Plan and the 2018-2021 TIP. Bellevue Corridor Improvements, which include the Bellevue I-25 intersection and adjacent key artery intersections, should definitely be in these documents in order to realize the multimodal vision set forth in the plan. RTD has invested very wisely in putting light rail stations at Bellevue and Orchard, but in order to actualize the multimodal vision, there needs to be access to build and develop the communities around these light rail stations. Access can only be realized by addressing the Bellevue Corridor. I suspect the oversight in not including these necessary improvements in the Metro Vision Plan and TIP stems from the fact that the Bellevue Corridor, I'm not telling you anything new, involves six plus separate jurisdictions. The Federal Highway, CDOT, Arapahoe County, Denver, Greenwood Village, Cherry Hills Village, and several metro districts. Hence, I suspect each jurisdiction may have thought the other was taking care of addressing this vital corridor. With expanding Bellevue Station development on the northwest corner of the Bellevue I-25 intersection, 1,500 new vehicles from 2015 through the end of 2017, significant growth both commercially and residentially on the northeast corner which I would guesstimate to easily be 800 to 900 cars over the same period, and increasing occupancy rates and projected development on the southwest corner of this intersection, 100 plus from the landmark, my home, alone since 2015, the intersection at Bellevue and Quebec has come to absolute gridlock at some peak hours. 
This intersection was graded F in the November 16 released Bellevue Corridor study, which was based upon 2012 traffic data. And though subsequent improvements were made to bring it to a passing grade for a short term, it, has already, it is already worse than ever. Bellevue Corridor improvements need real attention now. Greenwood Village has rallied partners and initiated the environmental assessment toward identifying the extensible solution for this gateway to Denver South I-25 corridor, an area which generates 30% of the state's revenues. I would ask that you prioritize this project such that the TIP can be expeditiously approved and sh shovels hit the dirt no later than 2020. Specific to where I live, within the area bounded by Bellevue 25, Orchard, and Quebec, people have already begun to joke that perhaps we need to be lobbying RTD for emergency light rail services, as should there be a medical emergency, emergency vehicles will find it next to impossible to get in and out of this area. I am speaking this evening on behalf of the landmark HOA, consisting of 270 owners. However, having spoken to a number of individuals from Greenwood Village, Cherry Hills Village, Denver, and the Denver DTC Chamber of Commerce, specific to this need, I know I'm reflecting the concerns of many more. Thank you so much, and I apologize. <laughs> Thank you. Thank any, you, sir. Any questions from the board? Next, Thank you I, again. I have uh, R. Paul Williamson, followed by David Rushman. Okay. David Rushman. And if I mispronounced your name, please correct me. <laughs> <laughs> it's David Ruckman. Thank you. Ruckman. First of all, I'd like to thank Jacob and you, the board, for what I think is a very impressive document. Uh, it's very, very good. I have a couple suggestions for you, though. I come representing the Jefferson County Local Coordinating Council. I think most of you are aware of what coordinating councils are and what they do. A number of you have jurisdictions or you participate in them in some way. Ours is part of Aging Well, a special program of Jefferson County and it's connected to the Department of Human Services. I say it because I'd like to speak to asking you and asking Dr. Cog to put more than one sentence on page 29 in this document about the importance of mobility services. When I'm talking mobility services, I'm talking about those people who can't get around based on driving a single occupant vehicle car and don't really have easy access to public transportation or RTD. So it's those people, some seniors, a lot of underserved, a lot of disabled, who need extra special attention, extra special mobility services. This 2040 document doesn't pay appropriate attention to that need. What I'd like to, and I'm gonna give you, set a little stage for you, and that is we've all passed whole fields of school buses that are sitting there unused. And they are used. They're used to transport kids and sometimes staff uh, to school every day when school is in session. But other than that, they just sit there. And that's a vast amount of supply for the burgeoning demand for mobility services for which the service providers lack vehicles, they lack the money for insurance, they lack the drivers. If we could somehow figure out a way to put the supply and the demand together, we would move greatly toward solving the burgeoning gap between demand for mobility services and the supply. Now, I mention it to say as we look forward to 2040, I'd like to suggest a new or an expanded role for RTD where they bring together all of those service providers, even if they don't have an RTD contract, don't have a a specific government affiliation, but are in, this, uh, in the business of providing service. I'd like RTD to work with Dr. Cog and Dr. Mack for a forward-looking vision to kind of help to solve or to ameliorate this problem. Um, and with that, thank you very much for your time. I'll pause there. Any questions from the board? Seeing none, next I have Drew Sweeney.
My name is Drew Sweeney. Uh, I'm from Greenwood Village. Uh, we're in the HOA right across from Gale O'Toole, so we were trying to coordinate things. I will first like to say we, I reiterate everything that Gail had said. Uh, from our standpoint, uh, the Greenwood Hills Homeowners Association is an area that's bounded by Bellevue, uh, Quebec, Orchard, and uh, Holly, and that our residents have to have to know how to put up with the Bellevue Corridor. So having Bellevue Corridor on the list, in our view, is a great idea. Uh, currently, because of the flow of traffic, everybody learns the different ways to get around. For example, uh, in the morning, turning right uh, and going from our neighborhood on Monaco, turning right and going eastbound on to uh, Bellevue is fine. Don't even th try to turn left at a place that doesn't have a light. Uh, now, in other areas, depending on where you're going, it's almost quicker for us to uh, sneak up at Monaco going north into Denver where there's a light and work the back way to get around some of the lights. It's, it's in a crazy place now, and of course, because of our growth that's going to be happening in the Denver area, it's only going to get worse. So I would ask that, like Gail, we make sure we pay attention to the Bellevue Corridor and, and come up with whatever the magic is and wherever the funding comes from. I hope we can figure out a way to do that. Thank you very much, and hello, Mr. Mayor. <laughs> Any questions from the board? I suspect not. Okay. Thank you. That is all the folks that I had signed up to speak during this uh, period. Is there anybody that wishes to address the board that did not sign up? Seeing nobody, this brings tonight's public hearing to a close. Thank you for your testimony and your interest. The board is currently scheduled to act on the, pro act on the proposed 2040 MetroVision Regional Transportation Plan and the 2018 through 2021 transportation improvement program and the associated air quality conformity uh, determination documents at its April 19th meeting. Thank you very much. Next item on the agenda is the report of the chair. Um, I really have no report this evening, so we will go on to the individual committee reports. Report on the uh, RTC. RTC was canceled this week, so there is no report on RTC. Report on the P&E committee. Director Pfeiffer. Microphone, please. Thank you. Chair, can you hear me now? Well, for the record. <laughs> yeah. Um, so P&E, uh, this is my first meeting uh, with the P&E group. We actually started it, or tonight, uh, had a special meeting to kick off the um, not only elect the, the vice chair, but we also kicked off our request for qualifications for our recruitment process and uh, for a new executive director. So that's been kicked off. We have a subcommittee that will uh, help narrow this down, and we're, we're planning on meeting on April 5th at 4 o'clock uh, to see what the final, hopefully the final RFQ will look like, and then we'll, we'll put it out. That's all I have to report. Thank you very much. Report on finance and budget, Director Dyack. Thank you, Chair. Um, tonight, uh, it was my first meeting as well, uh, chairing this uh, committee. And we elected a vice chair, Director Stoltzman. Congratulations on that. And uh, we talked about building lease negotiations. Um, there was an event here that um, the staff wants to maybe take a look at, uh, at lease. Uh, uh, to see if we can do some adjustments. Uh, if we do have a recommendation, it will be brought to the board. Thank you. The next item is the appointment of a member and an alternate to represent Dr. Cog on the State Transportation Advisory Committee. The current member is Commissioner Elise Jones, and the current alternate is Commissioner Roger Partridge. If there's anybody that would like to nominate themselves or, or thinks that they have an interest in this, please speak now. Seeing nobody, can I have a motion to uh, Move forward with. <laughs> Can I have a motion to move forward with those two as the so director moved. and alternate? Motion and a second. Any comments or questions or all those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstentions. 
The next is the appointment of a member and an alternate to represent Dr. Cog on the E-470 Authority Board. The current member is Mayor Ron Rakowski, and the current alternate is me. And uh, both of us have expressed an interest in remaining the member and the alternate on that board. Is second. Have a motion and a second. Any comments? All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Very good. Uh, report of the executive director. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry, Director I, Pfeiffer. I just wanted to say our vice chair is Mr. Beacom. So I'm, I apologize. I didn't call you now. You're my vice chair now. The vice chair in P and E. Yeah. Very good. <laughs> All right. Report of the executive director. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I do have a number of items this evening. I'll be quick. Um, the first I'd like to start with is a little bit of neat news. Um, uh, the, f the first ever Insurance Services Office, or the ISO, Class 1 Community Ranking in the State of Colorado was awarded earlier this month to the City of Federal, Federal Heights Fire Department. Um, it's, it's a very great honor. You probably heard only in Federal Heights. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly right. And, I mean, it is very prestigious. I mean, less than a quarter of 1% of fire departments nationwide have been able to, um, to achieve this prestigious award. I, and if nothing else, it identifies the high quality of work and collaboration that's, that's, uh, that's ongoing in Federal Heights. And ultimately, Mayor, this will have, it, at least the expectation is will have some effect on uh, insurance premiums for businesses and homeowners within, within Federal Heights. So congrats to Mayor Dick and uh, the staff at Federal Heights. Um, couple, here's my, my service announcements again with regards to one is on the uh, Dr. Cog Award celebration. Um, it's, it's, as you know, Wednesday, April 26th, and registration is now open. So uh, um, please get online and, and, uh, and sign up. There is some important information within the flyer itself. Uh, Mr. Mr. Rex? Yes. The flyer does not have the date. We look good. I look good, too. So what was that date again? April 26th. <laughs> April 26th. That will, that will be correct. Is that a... Is that an issue, not having a wow. date? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so April 26th, and we will correct that, certainly. Um, just so everybody knows, um, it's complimentary for directors, and, and you also you know, can bring a guest at a discounted rate. The actual, there's a code located at the bottom is board 17 that um, allow, that gets you that, that, uh, that discounted rate. Normally would be $89. It's, it's discounted to, uh, to $49. Um, Amelia Earhart will once again be emceeing the event. Um, we'll have a reception followed by a nice dinner and uh, promises to be a wonderful event. So we please, this is really your event and we strongly encourage you to celebrate the people, communities, and projects that make a difference in our region. Um, the other piece that I would like, yes. I just wanted to add that I think that uh, if you can encourage your alternate oh. to come to this as well. Yeah. Um, it's, it's nice to have alternates that come and uh, get a little better understanding of Dr. Cog, get exposed to a broader range of uh, board members and alternates. So encourage your alternate to come as well. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, no, definitely, that's the case. Um, the next piece I wanted to point out was the Bike to Work Day event. It's June 28th, and that is included on, on, on the poster. <laughs> um, our Way to Go team is planning the, the biggest and best event ever. Um, it's already the second largest event of its kind in the country. We had 32,000 participants last year. Um, the flyer shows the artwork of, uh, well, you know, artwork for posters that we, that, that we will have available to you all, um, whoever wants those, and as well as the basis for the T-shirts, uh, T-shirt design, which we, which we produce as well. Um, so the important information on the flyer itself is on the back side. And it talks about a Bike to Work Day open house, which will, which will occur on April, Friday, April 7th. And uh, so we encourage, uh, at that time, communities, employers are invited to attend that event um, to find out how to organize a, um, a stations or set up business teams. Really, anything you really need to know about the event uh, will be included. And there's two, two potential times on that day for, for participation at that, op uh, at that open house. So uh, the next topic is Small Communities Hot Topics to Forum. forum. Um, 
those of you who attended the, the, the last one, the inaugural, which was uh, last year, I think it was well received by all. I think we had a, a good time, great list of topics and good presenters. Um, the, uh, the, the Hot Topics 2 uh, form is, uh, is scheduled for um, uh, June 29th in this room, and the topics will be intergovernmental collaboration and affordable housing. So please, um, we encourage you to, uh, to partake in that event. Board orientation, we had a board orientation on February 16th. We have uh, 14 members and staff attend that. I hope I didn't bore you guys too much and got something out of it. Um, we are in the process of finalizing our schedule for the short courses that we mentioned during that, which is kind of a deeper dive into specific programs within the agency related to transportation or regional planning and, and uh, aging issues. So we'll get that information out to you real soon. But it, we will do those kind of uh, before or after meetings that you already have on your schedule so that you, it's not an extra effort for you to get down here. Grant Finder. This is just a reminder that uh, we have a 50, 50 seat membership for this online tool. Um, and if you're interested, please contact Flo, Flo Rotano and our staff for a tutorial if you would like to have that. If we get enough interest, um, we can certainly arrange a webinar with the Grant Finder folks. This is a tremendous tool, and it's you know you know it's it's one of those um, you know added added services for for you all as being a member of Dr. Cog, and we uh, encourage you to take advantage of that. Um, we hosted uh, earlier this month FHWA's Active Transportation Demand Management Workshop. Uh, it was held here on March, March 2nd, um, and its purpose was to strengthen the linkage between uh, TDM staff or Transportation Demand Management staff, pro professionals, and transportation professionals, particularly um, those in the operations field or traffic management folks, um, to discuss better ways to provide effective choices to improve travel reliability within the region. About 40, 40, member, 40 members of, our, um, of, of your staff as well as other TDM professionals participated in that and they had a very good discussion and are started on uh, the development of a strategic plan. Regional incident management. Um, I met with uh, Colorado State Patrol's uh, Deputy Chief Mark Savage and FHWA staff earlier, earlier uh, well, it was actually last week about the possibility of, facil of facilitating a regional discussion about incident management. Um, it's obviously a very important topic and I know a, a lot of members seem to coalesce around the uh, discussion we had about safety on our, on our, on our roadway uh, network there a few months ago when Steve Cook gave the presentation. And um, so we're in, we're in discussions about, you know, what our specific role would be, ours being Dr. Cog would be, um, and we're working with uh, uh, Deputy Chief Savage to get him back on, back um, probably at the May uh, board meeting to discuss this a little further and, um, and hopefully we'll be able to get some input from you all about what you believe our, our, our specific role should be here at Dr. Cog. Um, I was asked to serve on RTD's past program working group. Uh, we had our first meeting um, on, uh, this past Monday. And the purpose of that group is to make recommendations to RTD staff on revisions to all RTD past programs. Um, the working group will, and this was, um, there were four specific goals or, or um, um, things we will be working on, is to revisit and refine goals for each of the past programs, uh, refine pricing and administration of each past program, recommend past program policy revision, and recommend criteria for RTD um, to evaluate uh, future proposals on new past programs. So we'll be meeting over, over the next 10 months, and I'll be reporting back as often as, um, as you would like. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll report back all the time about what our progress is with regards to this. It's a very important uh, concept, and I appreciate RTD recognizing that and forming this work group. I think it's a great group, about 20 or so. <clears throat> and uh, and uh, we had a very good discussion, very very good introductory discussion about it. <coughs> Excuse me. Last but not least, um, I'd like to give a very hearty Dr. Cog welcome to FTA's new Region 8 Administrator, uh, Cindy Turwillinger. Um, Cindy, you want to just stand up and raise your hand? So you're going to hear a little bit from her later on. Hi, Cindy. First time actually, Cindy and I actually met too. So. Um, she spent more than, more than 20 years working in the public transportation industry and has been uh, at FTA since uh, 1991. Before becoming Region 8's administrator in January of 2017, uh, she worked in um, uh, FTA Region 7 office, which is located in Kansas City, as well as stints at, at Region 2 in L.A. and at headquarters. So um, 
So thank you for being here tonight, Cindy, and we appreciate it. Looking for a long-lasting relationship. That's it for me, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. So the next item on the agenda is the public comment period. Up to 45 minutes is allocated this time for public comment, and each speaker will be limited to three minutes. If there are additional requests from the public to address the board, time will be allocated at the end of the meeting to complete the public comment period. The chair requests that there be no public comment on issues for which a prior public hearing has been held before this board. Consent and action items will begin immediately after the last speaker. So we know we have one speaker, and that is R. Paul Williamson. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman and committee. I'm glad to uh, be here today and appreciate the opportunity to come before you. Uh, I have uh, been working for about a decade and a half with the U.S. Congress, U.S. DOT, FTA, NASA, Aerospace Engineers, DOE, CDOT, RTD, University Researchers, and about every other acronym that you can think of uh, to put together a new sustainable option for Colorado transportation. I'd like to especially thank uh, Rita Dozell, our representative some, from Superior, for encouraging me to uh, come to this evening to introduce you to what we're working on here in Colorado. Next slide, please. As you know, we're behind the proverbial $8 billion eight ball here in Colorado as far as transportation is concerned, and there's a raft of other things that we have to deal with in order to bring transportation to the place that we'd all like to have it. Next slide, please. What I'm here for today is to ask you to consider an investment in the sustainable 21st century transportation future. In this transportation future that we're looking at, we're looking at safe and secure transportation, affordable transportation, low impact transportation, accessible transportation, point to point, high speed transportation, flexible 24 seven availability transportation, low cost operation and maintenance transportation, business model PPP transportation, non-polluting alternative energy transportation and high capacity transportation all in one system. Next slide please. And if you'd click on the bottom of that for the video to the left there. There you go. This is a video that was put together for, for us at Universal Studios that demonstrates SkyTran, the system that I've been working on for this decade and a half. This is a uh, system that moves people from point to point on demand and it's on a two rail system as you can see one goes one direction and one goes the other. And what I'm looking for is inclusive collaboration uh, with the the Dr. Cog so that we can move together and that we can find a possibility of getting a feasibility study here in Colorado so we can be one of the first in the nation to make this system work. Baltimore is already moving in that direction. I thank you very much for your time. Any questions from the board? Thank you very much. Thank you sir. Is there anybody else this evening that would like to address the board? Seeing nobody, we'll move on to the consent agenda. Uh, the minutes of February 15, 2017. Any changes, corrections? Have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Opposed? Abstentions? Agenda item 10, which is attachment C, discussion of confirming the continuation of Doug Rex as acting executive director, Mayor Atchison. It is with great pleasure I'd like to move to approve Douglas W. Rex, and he still doesn't acknowledge what W is, to continue to serve as acting executive director and to fulfill the duties of that position until such time as the vacancy is filled and increases salary to the current level of the executive director's salary and provide a car allowance equal to the executive director's during this period while serving as an acting executive director for such pay to be retroactive to January 1st. 2017, stipulating that salary and benefits would return to current levels once the vacancy is filled. Second. Have a motion and a second. Discussion? Mr. Chair, if you might. Mr. Graves. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just want to take a moment to speak in favor of this motion and just acknowledge the exceptional work that Doug has done. Stepping into this role and providing leadership for the organization, it's been seamless. You provided professionalism and a focus on the details, and uh, I think we need to demonstrate our appreciation. Thank you. 
I'll Director echo, Pfeiffer. I'll echo uh, Director Graves' uh, comments as well, and his middle name is Wayne. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Director Atchison. Well, we've heard rumors that the W was whiplash, but we haven't heard that for sure yet. But to the comments that were already made and to the members of P&E who have been uh, looking through this for several months now, Doug has stepped up and done a yeoman's job of serving in two capacities, uh, not only as the acting executive director, but maintaining the relationship with his own department and roles and responsibilities. And I've seen a number of heads going up and down from the staff members who work with him on a daily basis. I run into him a lot more. Now he's covering two hats in different parts of the city. But uh, in all honesty, I don't think we could have asked for a more uh, courageous person to jump into this and take on the role he has, uh, that he has over the last few months. And I certainly applaud Doug for his uh, dedication to Dr. Cobb. Director Trular. I also think that. Mike, please. It's not on. It's not on. Oh, okay. Now it is. I also think Doug has done a good job, and I think that we should approve this motion. So I'll just add one, one quick comment, and that's that um, when the first executive meeting that Doug was at, I think he was a little bit of deer in the headlights, uh, but he has done a very good job in, in, uh, in guiding not only this overall board, but the executive board and, and uh, keeping his head above water. So any other comments? All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Thank you very much. Mr. May, Mr. Chairman, real quick, thank you all very much. It's very kind comments, and I appreciate it. I do love this place dearly, and, uh, and it hasn't only been me during this time period. I can tell you that the division directors have really stepped up and provided the leadership that's necessary for this agency, so I wanted to make sure everybody understood that. All right, the next item is agenda item 11, which is attachment D. And this is uh, related to soliciting interest for service on the two committees that were formed last year, the Finance and Budget and Performance and Engagement Committees. And if you, uh, if you look on the individual sheets, the Performance and Engagement and Finance and Budget, the two white sheets, what we did is we uh, did some one-year terms and some two-year terms so that there would be uh, overlap. So the people who are in the whatever color that is, the yellow, yellow orange, whatever it is. Highlighted. I have a little color issue. Just a little bit. Uh, it's bright, but what color bright? <laughs> um, so the, the people that are highlighted um, were one-year terms. The people that are not highlighted were two-year terms. So as you can see, there are people who um, would have to express an interest to stay on. And then if there are other people that express an interest to be on one of these committees, um, then, then that will be taken into consideration. The, uh, the nominating committee takes this under advisement, I believe, and, and makes their recommendations to the board. And statements of interest need to be submitted in writing to Connie no later than March 29th, 2017. So keep that in mind if you want to serve on one of these committees. Um, I will caution you that you did meet the two chairs, so keep that in mind when you're thinking about volunteering. Um, yes. Thank you. Um, Mr. Can, Mr. We, uh, can you tell us uh, when the meetings are? How frequently and when? Uh, Director Pfeiffer, when is, when is your meeting typically? Can you? Uh, it would be the uh, first Wednesday of the month after the workshop. And, and Director Dyack? We are right before the board meeting, so uh, 5.30 usually, third Wednesday. So we made them so that you're here anyway for either the work session or the board meeting, and one is before and one is after. Other questions or comments? Director Kniech. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Can you just clarify, I believe one of these committees was not at the capacity, so we may actually have more slots than there are highlighted names, and I can't remember uh, if, if that's accurate, but I, I thought we had less interest for one, one of the committees than the other. So correct me if I'm wrong, but how many slots are we filling in, as a maximum on each? Finance and budget is not at max. Okay. Um, so I think that we have... 
projects. We have we have twelve right now in finance right. and budget. So we actually have seven seats on finance and budget that will need to be filled. And and um, is it just the five on P and E then? Uh, yes, actually I think it's six on P and E. So there's five names highlighted, but there's yeah, the six. Yeah, I, I think that there was a sixth one that I didn't highlight. It's just a helpful for folks to know that if they're trying to figure out their odds, to know that there's more seats than you see highlighted here. So volunteer. Point taken. Other comments? Uh, Director if, I, Pfeiffer. if I remember correctly, when we went through governance, was it 15? 14. 14? Yeah, it was 14. It's okay. 14. Well, the membership of both those committees shall not exceed m more than one quarter of the total membership of the board. So we have about 56 members, so whatever that works out to be. We're not more than half. No, it says. Each one is one quarter. Yeah, not to exceed more than one quarter of the total membership. So, yeah, it's 14 per. Other questions or comments? All righty. So March 29th is your uh, your deadline to express an interest. And remember, that goes to Connie in writing. All right, agenda item uh, 12 is our legislative update. And uh, Mr. Morrow will take us through bills on which we've already taken a position and new bills. So you have uh, information under the tab um, attachment E, and then there's also a supplementary one that should have been on your table. Mr. Morrow. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I wanted to uh, start uh, by asking our lobbyists, Ed Bowditch and Jennifer Castle, to come up and say a few words about the state budget. The, uh, the March revenue forecast is going to be released uh, Friday, and that's going to key off the uh, real uh, real rush to get the budget done and I wanted to have them say a few more and it'll also provide a nice backdrop for some of our discussions on the bills too. Thank you Rich. Um, the, the Legislative Joint Budget Committee has been meeting since November um, in order to draft the budget for 2017-18 for the next fiscal year. Um, on Friday they will complete their figure setting, their initial figure setting for all state agencies and then they will also receive the next quarterly revenue estimate. The staff will digest all that over the, over the weekend and on Monday it is the day when the staff director comes back into the Joint Budget Committee and says based on all the recommendations you've made to date you've got X dollars available. Typically, and I say this with all due respect, there is a budget gap between what they had approved and what they had, had wanted to do versus what their available revenues are. At that point, on Monday and Tuesday and early next week, the Budget Committee can take any action to reduce some of the expenditures, some of the recommended expenditures they've made, or come up with alternative recommendations, such as um, uh, involving the hospital provider fee, either, either capping the revenues or making that into a Tabor enterprise, changing the senior homestead exemption, lowering the amount, of the senior homestead exemption or zeroing it out altogether as they've done twice before, changing the marijuana tax or any other type of budget option, either reducing an expenditure or raising a revenue. That will take place early next week. And then the budget, the long bill, is scheduled to be introduced in the Senate on Monday, March 27th. So there'll be a lot of action with the Budget Committee over the next 10 days. And Thank I, you. I noticed a wry smile on Director Zabo's face when <laughs> yeah, that was. He's had some experience with this. <laughs> uh, and so with that, I'll I'll uh, start onto the bills and probably ask Ed and Jen to stay there because there may be some other questions that I can't answer. Um, let me make a couple of introductory comments too. Um, first of all, I want to note if you look if you've looked at your matrix in response to Director Zabo's request very good comment last month we've added a little column for the fiscal notes that's a live link that you can go if you're online that you can go to actually see the the actual fiscal note um, but I've also where relevant I've tried to talk about fiscal impacts uh, in the staff comments as well so hopefully that that provides you with additional information um, the other thing is this time of year can get a little confusing 
because we have a situation where we've had two months where you've acted on bills. So that in your board packet, you have a matrix that is status of bills. Uh, but then there are bills that have been introduced since the last board meeting. So you have another piece in your packet that is new bills. Um, but then this time of year, there's always a lot of bills getting introduced. So sometimes after the packet goes out, we get more new bills get introduced before tonight's meeting. And so I think Connie emailed, uh, I think it was on Monday, out another list of what we call additional new bills. Uh, and that went out Monday morning, I believe. And we've put ha hard copies on the desk for, on the tables for you. So I, I think if it, it makes sense to just kind of start at the top and go down through. <laughs> uh, and if we need to move around, we can. Uh, so I'm, gonna, I'm just going to kind of weigh in and we can stop and ask questions or answer questions uh, as needed. Um, on the first one, the uh, status of bills matrix, there really hasn't been any significant changes on the bills there. So unless somebody's identified a you know, specific question or comment, we can move to all the new bills. Yes. Director Atchison. Just so we're all aware, I know uh, Dr. Cog has been watching the construction litigation stuff pretty tight. Uh, the one that we've been watching, mostly the head, we thought would have some chance. It did get out of the Senate, uh, went over to the House. Unfortunately, uh, 156 this morning was assigned to the kill committee by the Speaker. There's some discussion that one piece of that implied consent might be pulled out and introduced as a separate bill. Or if you recall that, that's basically what Senate Bill 157 did originally that was already killed. So the likelihood of anything coming out for construction litigation this year, in my personal opinion, is nil. Uh, and it's unfortunate that we've got this again. Many of us in this room have been down testifying to the legislature. We've been calling every congressional member we could get our hands on that this has got to get fixed on a statewide initiative and is not going to happen again. Thank you. So uh, with, if there's any, any other comments, I'll uh, move into the, uh, the list of new bills that starts with uh, House Bill 1191. And this one, is, it's a little bit of an esoteric issue. It deals with uh, what, they call, what they're calling demographic notes. And these are, this is a new, would be a new type of uh, document similar to the fiscal notes that are produced on bills now. Uh, but what would be different is, whereas the fiscal notes primarily focus on the costs or revenues of, uh, generated from a bill to the state or the state agencies, a demographic note on a very limited basis, not on every bill, but there would have to be a specific request from leadership on a handful of bills, would have the Legislative Council staff uh, do an analysis on different demographic uh, populations, whether if it's by age or income or uh, geography or so forth, and be able to provide the legislators with that additional information beyond just the pure financial. Um, based on the potential that some of these bills that get introduced could have different effects on, by age for instance, on older adults and so forth, um, I'm asking for support on uh, this opportunity to to get additional information on the impacts of some of these bills. So the staff recommendation on 1191 is support discussion? Move to approve. Second. Have a motion and a second to approve for support. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Thank you. All right, the next bill is 205, which is the first of a couple of uh, more transportation bills, not probably the one you're, you're wa waiting to get to, but um, <laughs> uh, that'll be coming up uh, in a minute. Uh, but this bill, uh, Senate Bill 205, introduced by Senator Kafalis and Representative Rosenthal, um, basically uh, increases the state sales tax by 0.25%. Uh, to uh, allow, I think it's about 1.6 or so billion dollars in bonding, and uh, does some other things uh, uh, for uh, 
uh, rail on I-25. I've talked to the sponsor who's holding the bill back and asked for it to be delayed because he's aware of other more prominent bills in the process. Um, so I put it for board direction, request it. We may just want to monitor it at this point like we have the other bills. So moved. Well, they're asking for direction. Monitor, okay. So the motion and second is to monitor discussion. Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstentions. So Senate Bill 205 will be monitor. So the, the next bill is, uh, um, and I actually I, I got a typo in there. It's, it says HB. It should be Senate Bill 213. Just notice that. Um, and this bill dealing with automatic driving motor vehicles. Uh, I'm, I think I'm going to ask Director Brockett to speak up and help me out with this, uh, but this is an issue that has come up in uh, uh, some of the local government meetings that I've been in recently. Um, a lot of folks are interested in having these, uh, the market for these vehicles uh, in, improve and increase, but there's also concerns with this bill and um, challenges to local control that are contained in this bill. So, but I understand that um, Boulder's taken a, a long look at this bill, and I'd appreciate it if you could get a little help on explaining it. Director Brockett. Sure. Um, thank you. So we did have a discussion at this, of this at a recent council meeting. Um, we're interested in seeing legislation that enables uh, autonomous vehicles going forward, but we were very concerned about it uh, being made a matter of statewide concern that would supersede any local authority. Uh, because this is an area where local jurisdictions may very well want to regulate in one form or another in ways that right now we're not sure what those might be. So we don't want those powers taken away from us. So we took a position of oppose on this bill. Other comments? Director Jones. In addition to the local control piece of it, I think there's a lot of folks that are watching what's happening with the autonomous vehicles and thinking they could be a really great thing or if not uh, properly um, sidebarred they could drastically increase VMT and there's nothing in the bill that really speaks to trying to make sure that this technology is used in a way that helps support our, our existing investments in transportation infrastructure rather than undermine it so in addition to the local control piece having the, those issues uh, addressed I think would be important as well so I would I would agree with an, either an opposed position or uh, a, oppose without amendment yeah. depending on what the staff prefers in terms of the level of investment you would put into lobbying this bill and, and I can add that CML does have a position of oppose unless amended and CCI is not taking the bill up yet I think they'll take it up at their policy committee tomorrow afternoon yeah director yeah. Hutchison director Hutchison the other part of this is this, uh, along with Metro Mayors, I know Heidi, myself, and some of the others from the executive committee have not had a chance to look at this, but we have been being lobbied very hard about getting something on the books to, to fix state law so that autonomous vehicles can at least be thought of here in the future. But I think we're all kind of surprised at the issue of taking away any level of local control on this, which, I, speaking out of turn, I think Metro Mayors will have a hard time getting behind this. So at this point, unless this is amended to take some of that out, I believe Metro Mayors will be in the opposed position of this. Director Zabel. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, it will be in my committee tomorrow at CCI, and um, we talked to the sponsor about it. And some of the things that are actually in the bill, he didn't necessarily want in the bill. Not sure why he didn't make sure of that. Mm -hmm. prior to dropping the bill but that's another story and so we're working with him and I guess one of his big concerns is that he didn't want um, local governments to impose new regulations on him that the state wouldn't he understands that we want you know the control if they're traveling through our jurisdictions so we're working with him so I think the um, oppose with amendments or something like that, because I believe this bill is going to look different than it does at this point. Uh, Director Truler. Isn't this something that's going to have to have some statewide control? Because vehicles go from 
one of our jurisdictions to other of the jurisdictions and if you it's if each city had different regular county or whatever had different regulations wouldn't that cause a huge problem for everyone I mean I, just realistically did you have a comment Jim oh, oh. yes yes um, one other thing to consider as well with this bill is that it's being brought forward by GM and so a lot of folks are concerned that this bill um, stacks the deck in favor of traditional auto manufacturers so Google Apple uber those type of companies have some issues with this bill as well too so I know there's some negotiations taking place between between those entities as well and so amendments could very well be coming uh, regarding that of director Williams then director Trular back to the local control part of it uh, local governments can prohibit like you know certain types of vehicles on trails and that sort of thing that's the kind of local control we need to have we, we don't want these cars on our trails and, and we wouldn't be able to the way it's written right now director Truler maybe we should just be monitoring this bill it sounds like it's a work in progress and it's still having amendments being made to it and maybe we should put it back on the agenda for next month director Brockett well I'll just offer one example of the kinds of regulations a local government might impose uh, imagine like autonomous vehicles that perhaps an operator of them might uh, want them to be circling continuously around the city you know uh, with wear and tear on the roads and pollution etc uh, a local government might want to say well there are certain designated areas where you would have to wait while you're waiting to pick up your your fares uh, we want to make sure that we have the ability to pass sensible uh, local control regulations like that and so I think we feel pretty strongly that we should at least uh, oppose and less amend it on this bill before I come back is there anybody else that wants a first shot at the conversation director Truler I move that we monitor this and put it back on the agenda for next month there's a motion to monitor There's a motion and a second. Discussion? Director Jones. I guess I, I appreciate um, your your sentiments, Director Trular. I guess I think we should be actively at the table to make sure that the bill comes out right. And so monitor makes us sort of passive spectators. And I think we have a good lobbying team, and I'd like to have them go to work for us by giving them a little bit direction on shaping this bill. So I will be respectfully voting against this and and supporting a an oppose without amendment motion. Direct, director Trular. you know I get that but it just sounds to me like this is a work in progress and but that by the time we come back next month it will be a far different bill than what it is right now so I'm suggesting that we might want to monitor it and see what happens with it because we're not close to the end of the legislative session director Zabel well and I guess if we um, oppose it or monitor it next month we can change our minds right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. of course so yeah so like it doesn't I I don't know I me mean, it doesn't matter if we can change our minds if it's something we can um seeing who is lobbying against it it's gonna have a rough time director Beacom my question is what is the difference with the oppose with amendments and monitor in actual time and cost to Dr. Cog and to the members. Well, I mean, for about the result in time. If you're talking specific about time, if it's a if it's a monitor bill, we'll just watch it and sort of stay on the sidelines, basically. Um, if it's an opposed unless am uh, amended, it's more like what uh, Director Jones said that that we would actually engage in the process and convey the board's concerns and actually try to be involved in whatever changes are going to be suggested on the bill. Director Beacom. Because this bill is very fluid right now because he doesn't even know what he's got in his bill or doesn't want some of the stuff, it would appear that if we were actively involved we might have more influence and monitor only. Mm -hmm. So I would prefer the oppose with uh, Amendment without a yeah. Director Mullica. And I'm also on board with that. I think that Dr. Cog needs to have a seat at that table and be a part of the conversation. So other comments. I had a I had a call the question in a second. All those in favor of calling the question, say aye. 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 Opposed? 
Okay, all those in favor of a position of monitor, please raise your hand. We lost. <laughs> all those opposed? No, we're not, it's not even close. All, all those opposed? <laughs> oh, uh, Oppose the monitor, yeah. Any abstentions? One abstention. Very good. Do we have a, another motion? Director Atchison. I would, I would move the, the uh, body consider this as an opposed uh, with amendments. Without. Without. Without amendments, I'm sorry. Second. Have a motion and a second to take the position of opposed without amendments. Discussion. All the question. <laughs> Do we need the other All right. All those in favor of the opposition with uh, without amendments, say aye. 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 Opposed. <coughs> Abstentions. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Uh, let's see. The next one uh, is a housing bill, and actually, it, it's as much coming from. Uh, an aging, uh, our aging perspective as housing. Uh, House Bill 1159 deals with uh, uh, landlords' ability to uh, um, prevent uh, or actually even evict uh, residents of uh, apartment homes, and it actually creates additional uh, crimes and ways for uh, for landlords to. Uh, get folks to leave their properties. And um, I think I've heard that this bill was introduced primarily to deal with some like homeless squatter situations. But uh, what we've become concerned with other advocacy groups for, uh, for seniors and older adults is that um, there's already statutes in the law dealing with this sorts of things and, and providing for forcible entry and detainer while this bill creates two new crimes that gives the landlords more of an ability to go after the tenants and um, could also bring in uh, or have impacts on persons with disabilities that might be living in these places and, and older adults. And you know, it, particularly in situations where we've seen with in recent years um, a lot of situations where uh, older adults are, are, are uh, being evicted or getting rental increases on a short notice and not being able, you know, being on fixed income and so forth, not being able to afford their rent and having, having to leave uh, and, and struggling to find any place that they can afford to live. So we've been, we're, we're presenting it to you from the perspective, uh, that perspective of the aging folks that um, this could have a negative impact on uh, uh, folks that we advocate for. So, uh, Director Williams. I was just going to say I would move to oppose. Have a motion and a second to oppose. Director Wynn. Uh, Shaw, I'm sorry. That's Director. all right. Thank you. I, I guess if I'm reading this correctly, the landlord still must get a court order to lock the premises. I. I feel concerned that we're, you know, we're creating problems that don't exist or won't exist. Well, part of it is, if I might, um, the, part of it is that also the, the, the bill does not provide for adequate notice for the, for the renter and opportunity to respond to that uh, filing. And so they, they, they could have a judgment entered against them without even knowing that it happened. And they don't have, and if they do, they often don't have enough, very much time at all to respond to it. So I guess that brings up a question for me, and that is, so they can have a, a judgment against them without them being present to defend themselves? I don't know if I'd go that far. Okay. Yeah, I don't know if I'd go that far. Okay. Other questions or comments? Director Crispin. Um, I, I would argue that the current forcible entry and detainer laws have been on the books 
for many decades. And uh, so you've had a lot of input and balance on them. I do not think that um, accelerating the process in an already accelerated process. Forcible entry and detainer is an accelerated process for the landlord. And thus, um, I, I would be concerned uh, to accelerate it any further. Other questions or comments? Seeing none, we have a motion and a second to oppose House Bill 1159. All those in favor? Opposed? Abstentions? Two abstentions. Okay. Thank you. Um, the next bill uh, was mentioned earlier. Well, Senate Bill 157 has already been PI'd. That was one of the uh, construction litigation bills. So we can move on to the next bill after that. Um, and this is the last of the new bills, but we're still going to have another matrix to get through. Um, this bill is <laughs> sent as House Bill 11, it's that time of year, uh, House Bill 1187, and then you've probably all heard about this, um, I, and since it does have uh, relationships to the budget and to state revenues, um, I thought I would at least call it to your attention, have you discuss it and see whether or not you want to take a position on it. Uh, this is the bill that is... Uh, uh, sponsored by uh, Representative Thurlow from the Western Slope and, and Senator Crowder from uh, Southern Colorado that would essentially change the formula that is used under, under the Tabor Amendment to calculate the state's uh, revenue cap. Instead of using what we have now, uh, inflation plus population, to, for that growth factor, it would use uh, the change in personal income on a five-year rolling average. And that's the really short explanation of it. And when we can try to answer more questions if you want more detail on it. Uh, but it, 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 would, it would change uh, from year to year what the actual uh, amount of revenues that the state would be able to uh, have to to spend and could also have impacts on the um, uh, the rebates uh, that that may um, go to the voters in any given year. Director Jones. I was just going to ask what the anticipated impact would be on available transportation funding coming from the state. Um, the the state does have a formula whereby certain monies through Senate Bill 228 was passed a number of years ago, get allocated to transportation. I don't recall the specific amount of dollars that would be directed under, if this bill were to pass this year, pass the voters, how much of that would go to Senate Bill 228. Having said that, it would, in, in most years, most people believe, it would give the state a larger Tabor revenue limit. The state could keep more money and make more of those allocations either to the operating budget or fulfill Senate Bill 228. It, the current fiscal note estimates a decrease in the Tabor refunds in the next few years in the range of $150 million in each of the next two years. I have Director Atchison and then Director Zabel. Ed, looking at what's in this particular bill and what's coming up in a few minutes on 1242, there's a conflict between the two as I was I'm trying to get that to straighten well, my head. But if this move. one takes some portion of it, increases it, and then 1242 looks like it takes it away from it because it reduces the, the 228 funds. If I'm, am I correct or am I misreading that? Um, yes, you could say they are in conflict on that one provision, mm -hmm. that this could potentially allow for more money through the Senate Bill 228 transfers, whereas um, House Bill 1242 eliminates the 228 transfers. Right. That's but looking point. at it another way, they're not in conflict from the perspective this one would just allow the state's revenue cap to grow, the other one addresses a, a tax issue. Right. So. Director Zabel. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Ed, you mentioned that it would change the, the Tabor allocation for the state, but wouldn't it do it for uh, special districts and municipalities? And um, I, that is a good question, and I haven't focused on that question, okay. and I apologize. Because I know at Urban Drainage we talked about that, okay. and they said it would affect them. Yeah. 
for those for the yeah. positive right so I'm assuming that it then would affect all of us for those local governments that have not debruced right. correct right yeah if you're debruced you already have the limit okay yeah. well has it been assigned uh, anywhere in the Senate yet? Uh, yeah. State affairs? Yes. And it's <laughs> Figure out where that's going. <laughs> going to join 156. Other questions or comments? Did we have a motion on this one? There was one up. Oh, I'm sorry. We're, oh, excuse me. Director Greenberg. Um, how would this bill impact um, shortfalls in education funding? Um, conceivably, if the state has a higher TABOR limit, the state would have more revenues to allocate as it sees fit. So um, there are a number of education organizations stretching from the Regents of the University of Colorado, Colorado Mesa University, the Colorado Association of School Boards that have come out in support of this. So um, most people believe it would just allow the state to have more revenue and therefore make those choices. Other questions or comments? Seeing none, I would entertain a motion. <laughs> or not. Or not. <laughs> it looks like uh, Director Jones. Well, just to go back to, it's been assigned to Senate State Affairs. So if we want to save ourselves the trouble, it, it looks like it's on its way to its own de demise. So we could just monitor it. Yeah. For that short amount of time, so I'd I'd make a motion to monitor. That would be that would be fine. See, you got your monitor position. Yeah. <laughs> have have a second a motion and a second to monitor. Other discussion. All those in favor of monitor. Aye. Opposed. Abstentions. Thank you. Okay. House Thank Bill 1253. You. All right. So the. Um, got a few aging bills for you. House Bill 1253 is actually an, uh, a bill dealing, uh, as it says, with financial abuse of older adults. And uh, Representative Danielson, who's the uh, House sponsor of it, has uh, been a leader on this issue in the legislature over the last couple of years. She's carried a number of bills uh, helping to refine the mandatory reporting law and other adult abuse legislation that uh, was uh, enacted by the legislature a few years ago. Uh, this bill um, tries to bring in uh, financial uh, services professionals uh, into the mix. They have not been uh, in incorporated into that in the past. And I wanted to ask Jennifer real quick, did you tell me this was uh, also a department bill? Yep, this is a DORA agenda bill. So the Department of Regulatory Agencies, it's one of their high pri highest priority bills as well. Um, but again, the, uh, 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 from the aging perspective and the AAA perspective, we've supported these bills, uh, these types of bills for many years and have worked for a long time to uh, strengthen the uh, uh, reporting and, uh, uh, and supporting the DAs. And, the, and a lot of DAs are behind a lot of this as well uh, on these issues. So on that, on that basis, we're asking for your support again. Questions or comments? We have a motion of, for support. Second. Motion and a second. Any discussion? I'll say one thing, and just um, I know that I'm preaching to the choir, but um, in my ward in Aurora, Ward 5, Heather Gardens is fully in my ward, and it's 4,800 um, people in, in a retirement community. And I am amazed and horrified at some of the questions that, that some of these folks ask me about. Sh should I, you know, if somebody contacted me for X, should I reach back out to them or whatever? And I, it, it's amazing. I mean, so the, so the financial abuse aspect of this rings very, very uh, strongly with me personally. Have a motion and a second. Any other discussion? <laughs> All those in favor of a position of support. Aye. Aye. Opposed? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Lots of Bob Roth pins there. <laughs> Thank you. All right, the next bill actually now has a number. It, it was just actually got the number today. Uh, the local pace ombudsman bill is uh, House Bill 1264. 
and uh, this we're asking your support on this particularly because Dr. Cog uh, staff myself and Jayla and a few others have been uh, uh, involved in this bill for or in this issue for over a year now and helped draft the bill and and carry it to this point and we're we're happy to have uh, uh, bipartisan sponsorship in both uh, uh, houses and so we're uh, uh, the bill was again just uh, introduced, and so we're hoping that we can uh, officially support the bill now. Director Jones. I move that we support the bill. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Thank you. That's a relief. <laughs> um, uh, the next bill on the records checks for employees serving at-risk adults. Uh, still hasn't actually gotten a, a number assigned. I checked this afternoon, so uh, it should be any, any moment now. But uh, the bill has been uh, filed uh, with the House, and so it, it will be introduced. This one is another department bill. This is Department of Human Services uh, number one priority bill, um, and it, it, it requires uh, di various different, I think they're listed here, various different employers that um, employ folks that work with at-risk adults to do records checks uh, on those individuals. Uh, it includes the area agencies on aging as one of those employers and uh, if you've got detailed questions I can call on Jayla to answer them, uh, but she tells me that we already do uh, various different background checks and records checks, so we're perfectly uh, fine with this bill. Uh, but it, it, it's it's and and it's been a stakeholder process with the uh, department working on this and getting to this point. So again, in that category of protections uh, for uh, at-risk adults, we'd ask your support on this bill as well. Questions or comments? Move to support. We have a motion and a second to support. Discussion. All those in favor, aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions. Thank you. All right, the next bill starts our transportation bills. And um, this is a bill that uh, uh, Director Shakti had asked us to put on the list for this month. Uh, so we've done that. Uh, and I had a conversation with her. There. She's unable to be here tonight, but her. Uh, um, alternate has been coached on it, so I'm going to call on uh, direct. Gutwein. Dana. Yes. Thank you. Um, thank you. So this is a bill um, from Senator Andy Kerr, um, one of our Lakewood senators, um, who also happens to be a, an avid biker. Um, and basically it's about, it's a safety issue and making sure that uh, the different classes of electrical electric bikes are um, labeled and we also have support from our staff saying and I'll just read brief it's very brief um, basically electric bikes are the fastest fastest growing segment of bike sales and the purchasers are mostly elderly um, in many cases they're almost impossible to detect from a distance and so this bill gives cities the ability to tailor or restrict on trails um, based on the appropriate class of cycles so that we don't have really fast electric bikes on our trails. Um, and that is what I have, and thank you. Questions or comments? Director Christman. Uh, one of my questions is in the comments, it says local authorities may prohibit the use of class one or class two bicycles. Uh, mm. I'm assuming then that we could not prohibit the use of class three on our trail? Is that how it's written? I, it, I don't, it, it would be whatever's in current law now. If you're prohibited from doing uh, class three now, then it doesn't change that. So I don't know if that's the right answer for you, but I don't know if the in bill. In my jurisdiction, no motorized vehicles are permitted on any trail, whether it's an electric bike or uh, a battery operated skateboard mm -hmm. so I would not want to lose that authority yeah I don't think it changes that existing authority if you have that authority now to prohibit it it wouldn't change that 
Okay. So local authorities may prohibit the operation of class one, class two, and class three pedestrian. Do you have the authority now to prohibit class three? We have the authority to prohibit everything. What is class three? So why is that in there if it's not checking it? If it's not overriding these uh, is it local is it specific is that specific I don't know the details of the law is that but is, is that specific to electric assisted bicycles and is it specific I, to I'm bike or pedestrian paths here. yeah I'm that's what, reading what you have here right and it, what I'm asking is there is a distinction being made here what is the legal impact okay. of that dis distinction with respect to local authority I would have to look at the bill and the current statute to get a specific. So I think in addition to understanding that, it would be nice to have some definition of what class one, class two, and class three is. What the, what those, I mean, is that like a, a power factor that they have? Is that a speed that they could attain? I mean, I don't know what those are. Uh, 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 Director uh, Pfeiffer, he's the handy electronics yeah, guy. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, and I, I I thought it, but I was just confirming. It, it I believe it's a a pedal assist electric bike is a class three. So, I mean, we're talking about that in our community. So it's not a an electric bike. It's just an assist with the uh, pedaling. Yeah. Have you ever, so it makes the pedaling. Am I right? I don't know. He, I, no. I don't know. In, in pedal fact, assist. Class one is pedal assist. Oh, I have it back. Two is bikes with throttles. Class three is. Speed pedelecs or pedal assisted bikes that can reach assisted speeds up to 28 miles an hour. Yeah. So, yes, but it's class three is the fastest. With a, the with a pedal assist. You said it. You said class three is a pedal assist. Yes. That's it was class, class one. one. Class one. Well, re read class three. Uh, so, this is from the, the California regulation. Class one consists of pedal assist bikes, right. class two of bikes with throttles. Both are limited to motor assisted speeds of 20 miles an hour. Class 3 consists of speed pedal acts or pedal assist bikes that can reach assisted speeds so it's a up speed. to 28 miles It's a an speed hour. difference, so 28, 20, up to 28 miles I just hour. want to prohibit all of them. So Director Williams. I feel like this bill maintains our local control. It just clarifies it in the state bill, but yeah. that's what I'm hearing it saying, is that we still have local control over that. So. If that's the case, then I would move to support. We have a motion to support. Do we have a second? second. Director Trular. I'm a little reluctant to vote on this when we don't know for sure what they say and whether it might impinge on some of our local control. So that's the problem I'm having with it. Well, I would, I don't know this for certain, but my, my guess is that what Director Williams just stated is is correct that this does not take away local control if if cherry hills village already has no motor assisted uh in the city on their trails that would not change that director stolzman so i think a number of interesting questions have been raised and i really appreciate it it's just that this bill if you read in the staff comments this bill removes electric assisted bicycles from the defi definition of motor vehicles so i think director chrisman raises an interesting point that if we have the authority now to prohibit motor vehicles and this is taking an electric bike out of the definition of mo motor vehicles it seems worthwhile to answer that question before we continue on. So I think there's been a lot of interesting debate and it would be worthwhile to monitor and have staff bring us back further information so that we can confidently support this. Director Williams. I, I, I'd like to withdraw my motion. I, I think that made a lot of sense. I don't know if that's proper under Robert's rules. Okay. I should know that as a mayor, but I don't. <laughs> Director Brown. Take it to the There's bill. Section there that talks about it doesn't prohibit a city from prohibiting. It doesn't say one, two, four, three. It just says the city's not prohibited from uh, authorizing or not is equal to authorize or prohibit any electric bicycle and pedestrian traffic work with other laws. So it doesn't. I know that's what it says in the staff comments one and two, but it's mm -hmm. not written that way in the actual. Okay. And I know the feedback I got from staff is that they didn't feel that it limited them. Direct, 
Director Brockett. Okay. Well, thank you, Director Brown, for that. But I, I found Director Stoltzman's comments to be um, persuasive, so I'd like to make a motion that we monitor this bill. Second. Have a motion and a second to monitor. Oh, Director Jones. Get that monitor bill no matter what. <laughs> <laughs> Director Jones, no? No. Okay. Well, it's so early. Have a motion and a second to, to monitor <laughs> discussion. No. Seeing no discussion, all those in favor of a position of monitor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions. Thank you. Okay, we will bring that back next month. Uh, um, so now we get to the bill you've all been waiting for. And just coincidentally, I think we've saved the best for the last. <laughs> Maybe. Uh, this is uh, House Bill 1242. And uh, this is, I'm sure, the bill that you've all heard a lot about with the uh, uh, Speaker of the House and the President of the Senate uh, as co-sponsors and um, we've put it on your list for asking direction from the board. Uh, would you like a little bit of an outline or summary of what's in the bill so that you all are working off the same information? Please. Which I could ask yep. Ed and Jen are prepared to do that and then we can get into the conversation. Go ahead, please. Okay, House Bill 1242 that was introduced a week ago, and its first hearing is a week from today, um, sponsored by the President, uh, by the Speaker of the House and the Chair of the House Transportation Committee, and the President of the Senate and the Chair of the Senate Transportation Committee. So you immediately start off with leadership and bipartisan support. Um, there are a number of transportation bills that have been introduced so far, and probably more to come. There's a couple of threshold questions that you have to ask when looking at any of these bills. First of all, does the transportation measure provide new revenue or is it dependent on a reallocation of existing revenue? Well, certainly this bill uh, submits a question to the voters for a tax increase. Um, does the transportation bill just focus on highway construction or does it have other components to it? And this bill certainly has highway construction and multi multimodal transportation options. And the third is who picks the highway construction projects? Is that through the existing planning plan, or is it the legislature coming up with a list? And this bill, 1242, utilizes the existing planning apparatus in the Colorado Department of Transportation. To briefly summarize, 1242 would submit a question to the voters to raise the state's sales tax by 0.62% for 20 years. It would use, that would raise roughly 650 to $700 million of new money per year. Of that new revenue, 300 million would be used to pay off the bonds that would be issued in conjunction with this, the trans bonds. Of the remaining 400 million, 120 million would go to a transportation options fund, and the remainder of that 400 million, the, uh, the 280 million, would go evenly to the cities and counties to be allocated according to current law, but it would be a 50 50 split at that point. That money that is directed to the Transportation Options Fund um, could be used for multimodal transportation, benefiting seniors, um, uh, uh, rural areas through flexible public transportation, enhanced mobility, and safe routes to school, and those sorts of things. So that's just a brief summary. Jennifer will add a couple of the comments that we picked up in the last week since the bill has been introduced. Yeah. So there's been a lot of chatter on the bill. I'm sure, as, as you all have seen, there's been a lot of press coverage as well, too. But a couple of the main concerns that, that um, organizations have been bringing forward, um, first and foremost, CDOT is seeing a double loss in revenue, one from the decrease in faster fees, and then also from a reduction of the 228 transfers. Um, also, the money that is going to CDOT for funding, that uh, number remains stagnant. It is locked in into statute. Um, also, it creates a new type one um, committee within the Department of Transportation that um, looks at the multimodal projects and the multimodal modal fund um, without um, taking into consideration the Transportation Commission. And then also for those local governments that have not debruced, they might not be able to accept um, some of these funds. The main concern and I think the one of the largest challenges that we'll see as this bill goes through the process is that a lot of folks, especially in the Senate, see this bill as a tax increase. But like any good negotiation, um, nobody leaves happy, right? And so there, there's something for both sides um, in this bill. 
<laughs> Director Atchison. Yeah, and kind of following up with what Ed and Jennifer had just said, uh, Metro Mayor's Executive Committee has been watching this like a hawk because of the fact that one of the biggest things uh, we've done with this is also coordination with Impact 64. We have a statewide coalition that is behind this bill, understanding that the fine points of this are still being worked out. It's the only opportunity we have for any kind of a transportation bill in 2017 that has revenue coming with it. Otherwise, everything that's being proposed is taking money out of the general fund that doesn't have money in it or can't spend it. Part of this, that's the biggest piece that we have been fighting for from Impact 64 and Metro Mayors both, is flexible spending. If the money gets to your community, whether it's at the county level or the municipal level, it's your money to spend. No one has the ability to tell you how to spend it. You can partner with any of your communities or your counties or any other group. You can also use the money and you're coming to you to do matching funds for the MIS portion of this as well. This has got a lot of win points in it. There are some downsides, but a lot of that is still going through the negotiations, as Jennifer and Ed said, because this thing is only on the floor for a week. But one of the pieces that we are going to continue to push for is more local representation on the commission who is going to make the decisions that how this money comes down. We can't just let this be at the state level. Otherwise, we lose what we've been fighting for on the transportation side. If we don't get this through this year as a referred measure, then we're looking at Impact 64 and some of the bigger groups. Uh, God, I'm trying to think of half the names of them all of a sudden. Uh, the Sierra Club and all these other groups coming together, they have to make a decision by March the 24th. If we don't get a referred measure by the 24th, that throws us into an issue of having to go to the ballot through petitioning and paying for that with public money to get it on the ballot for the November election. That's about a $3 million to $5 million effort to raise the money to get it on the ballot. Jennifer, you and Ed, anything else? that I'm forgetting. Mm -hmm. Just to emphasize that everything we described and everything you mentioned is still subject to negotiation right. as it goes through the process. Right. So I have Director Mullica, then Director Kanich. Director Mullica. Thank you, Chair. And Mayor Atchison, I appreciate you uh, continuing to fight to get some local representation on that board. Uh, I have several questions, though, um, because coming from a municipal standpoint, uh, an increase in sales tax uh, we'll put some municipalities over that 10% mark, which is kind of that ceiling that, that has been there for a while. And so with that being said, was there discussion or, or negotiation or anything in regards to a use tax or a gas tax? And I understand there's, there's issues with that, but um, essentially paying for what you use. And then I also have a question in regards to saying, um, do municipalities have to or, or local authorities have to match the funds that they get from from this transportation money that, that would be coming in through this. It says funding will require an equal or local match. Just and so, funds. Just um, from Yes. Okay. Um, uh, to so. your second point, yeah, the local match is for those multimodal funds, not for the regular construction dollars that get allocated to the cities and counties. Uh, to your first question uh, about the gas tax has never been considered a viable option at the State House. There is too much resistance. Um, to submitting a question to the voters to raise the gas tax, primarily because the polls just say that is a loser um, if it gets to the voters. In addition, people recognize that the gas tax is, is in, in the long run, a declining source of revenue as cars become more efficient. And I think somebody mentioned today as well, too, that if, if you were to have a gas tax increase, um, I think gas is, what, 220? Two dollars and twenty cents an hour, or something like that. Um, in order to generate the same amount of money from the sales from the sales tax, um, gas would increase to about three fifty, three sixty a gallon. So some folks are looking at that and thinking that that is too large of an increase. Yeah, but it, and but it, um, I'm I'm sure that was discussed in the negotiation. Yeah. Director Kanich. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, having sat at the 
MPAC 64 table in the past, I don't sit on it currently, but having sat on it in the past and sat on a, a, a regional body we had for a while, the MTD, the Metropolitan Transportation District Conversation. So we've had some regional conversations and state ones. Um, I, I'm, I think this bill is, is, is um, important and I think it's great how much, for example, that it, it commits to multimodal and that it's got a significant share back. Um, so that's my personal comment about the bill. I will say that as a jurisdiction, um, specifically for the council, we are going to be talking about this bill more in, in a committee that I chair next week. I won't be able to take a position tonight. One of the things we're going to have to have an honest conversation with our council, though, about is, um, is some disproportionate impact that this has. Um, and and um, this may be something that intuitively many of us understand, which is that the metro area generates a significant amount of sales tax. And so in some ways, any statewide measure that involves our sales tax revenue involves us in some ways being a donor and, and not getting back dollar for dollar what our residents are paying in sales tax. And, and I think that's okay, right? I mean, for us to support rural areas of the state and for us to, um, you know, be in it together, there is an understanding that sometimes the economic engine of the state has to do a little donors. When you take this down to the level of Denver, though, I just want folks to kind of just be aware that this hits us particularly hard because more so than anyone in the, in, the, in the regional area, we generate even more sales tax. And we are not treated as a county in the formulas. You may know this, but we're a city and a county. We're treated as a city, which gives us a smaller share. <laughs> Uh, and, and in addition, we only get one share. So whereas if you think about the residents of Lakewood, you know, they're counted both for Lakewood's proportion and they're counted for Jefferson County's proportion. Yeah, right. <laughs> so our residents are only counted once. And so I, I don't, I, I'm not at all predicting, you know, that this would be a deal killer, but I just think it's really important to understand how really serious of a concern that is for elected officials in Denver to see that not only are we sending more out than we're receiving while we have this really dense population that requires, you know, you know, investment, but also just that, that you know, in the share back portion, it, it, it's just hard. And, and these are longstanding formulas. We had a long conversation about them when we were looking at whether we should go for some kind of regional measure. And, and again, I share this not to say that this doesn't mean this is a good proposal or that we might support it as a council. Obviously, we, we form our legislative positions in partnership with the mayor's office. Um, and so both sides kind of have to come to agreement on our legislative positions. Um, but, but I think I just took it as a moment for folks to kind of understand how this math works and just what it means to use this particular source in this way um, in terms of some disproportionate impacts. So just, just a little educational moment, and I, I, you know, I hope that we'll have a, a firm position. We'll see what the bill looks like by the time we're here next month, but I'm going to be abstaining this time. Thanks. Director Williams and then Director Jones. Um, I'll be abstaining, too, because of many of the same reasons, especially the fact that I haven't discussed it with the City Council. We haven't taken a position. The staff is looking at it right now, um, trying to determine if it's you know good. I personally am concerned with sales taxes, which we've had lots of those discussions with Metro mayors. Um, but I do think that the formula worked out better than what we had hoped, especially on the multimodal side. So um, Metro mayors is, has not taken a position yet either. And so because of those two entities not taking a position yet, I wouldn't be able to do that tonight. Director Jones. Uh, I appreciate the comments that were just made, and it's certainly something that we should all be taking a close look at. Um, Boulder County is supporting this bill. Um, we spent a lot of time thinking about it and, and working on it, encouraging the legislature to do something to generate new revenues. And we feel like this is a pretty good uh, starting place for the legislature on this, particularly, I mean, there's a nice balance in terms of um, increasing uh, revenues for local governments and maximizing our flexibility to use them, including taking off the cap that we currently have on use of funds for transit operations. Um, it also uh, addresses the mobility issues. One of the powerful pieces of the Impact 64 discussions, which have been hosted by Dr. Cog in this room, is to, to have Club 20 um, Action 22 and Progressive 15 are the other way around. I always get them wrong. Yeah, that's right. Did I get them right? Um, Dr. Cog, Metro Mayor representatives all talk 
um, in agreement about the need to have a significant amount of money for mobility, recognizing that it looks differently in different parts of the state, but a multi multimodal pot that can fund senior transit services, which are needed everywhere in the state, that can provide uh, safe routes to school, also needed everywhere in the state, um, bike lanes and sa safety shoulders on rural highways, urban transit, all of these things are important to, to towns and cities and counties across the state. And for, for folks to sit in this room and come together on that was pretty powerful. So we're supporting this as we really want to make sure it gets through the legislature. It's not an easy conversation for some law lawmakers. So I think it's important to the degree that people can support this conversation. You know, obviously we're at the beginning, not the end of it. Um, but I think it's, it, I think it will be people outside the gold dome that gets it through the legislative process if we're successful, so. Director Brockett. I'll, I'll agree with Director Jones's comments, but I just wanted to offer up that our council did discuss this at a recent meeting, and while uh, we were not at all thrilled with the sales tax mechanism for funding it, um, uh, for the reasons Director Mullica mentioned, um, we are supporting uh, the bill uh, because of the significant uh, multimodal component to it and the share back mm -hmm. and the local control and then all the reasons that Director Jones mentioned. So I'll encourage us to support it here at Dr. Cog as well. Director Pfeiffer. I think it gets uh, even more complicated because I know some cities and communities have passed tax already. You know, I think Commerce City, you were successful on it. We weren't. A few of our neighbors weren't either. So it, it, we're in a not just to include what Robin said and everyone else said, which is complicates the situation even more. Um, but if other communities keep passing sales tax for their road only issues, we're gonna we're, there will be no statewide anything for anyone. So we're gonna get to a point where that 10% mark is gonna be for a lot of other people. I don't know how that would impact Commerce City, who just did theirs. Um, but you know. It's timing right now, so you know. Right now, we're we're leaning towards supporting it, but you know, it, it's a tough it's a tough, complicated situation. So we got to keep that in mind. That if we go another year or two without this, um, there could be another dozen or two dozen communities that just add another penny to their sales tax, and that just then then that population is going to turn around and say no. And guess what? The no gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So that's kind of where we are right now. So, Director Graves. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And oh, I'm going to back off of that mic just a little bit. Mm -hmm. That was heavy. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. First, thanks for everybody's comments. Uh, for my colleague, uh, Director Kanish, I wanted to offer the executive branch. She's certainly the legislative branch, and we do partner in making decisions on behalf of the city and county of Denver. I just wanted everybody in the room to be very clear that the mayor's office is really giving this bill a fair hearing. We think that it has a lot of strengths in it. Uh, we've, we've been a part of a lot of the conversation at the Metro Mayor's Caucus and Impact 64 as well. Uh, we are also eyeballing, as I think many of you are aware, a general obligation bond as well, right? And so there are a number of different things that we're looking to address the needs of our constituents while also trying to be mindful of the needs of the state. Even if we look at the rapid growth on the front range, we're really aware of the fact that in order to fuel that growth, we need to make sure that goods and services can travel freely across the state of Colorado. And so I just wanted to make sure that everybody was aware where the mayor's office was. Thank you. Director Partridge. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, we had a discussion today with our board, and we actually took a position and monitor, and I'll explain that. When you look at all of us in this room, all of us, are uh, we are heads of our jurisdictions. We are putting a fiduciary responsibility to provide for transportation. Whether we have a mixed board politically or not, or whether we even state that political uh, uh, position, I doubt there is anybody in this room that does not provide for transportation in their community. So we look at it that. All of us in this room come to that decision one way or the other and provide that transportation. We get the job done. Even look what we do here in Dr. Cog. We have federal funds that come in. We get it done. So with this, we had a discussion. Somewhat it is unfair to put it on us and anybody else to say, what do you think we should do here, state legislature governor and both houses of the legislature? What do you think we should do? I think it's time to put our foot down and say, no longer do you ask us. You guys get in the room, 
somewhere create a balance, whether you do it in the present budget, whether you do it at the ballot box, whether you make some decision, however you're going to do it, it is time for you to man up and do it. I have to say we already saw it with construction defects, the disappointment that has occurred that here again, three years in a row, nothing. Transportation funding, I think we've all done some of our surveys, we all kind of know who doesn't support some increased uh, transportation funding. That's a no-brainer. How it's going to get done, for put it on anybody else besides the, the governor and the two houses, we think it's unfair in a respect. The other thing, taking it to the ballot box, I think it's what we can all say we support to let the people make the decision. But for us to go out and say that we are in a position to, to lobby for or against, in all respects, I think it is we support the ballot box. That's how, how we got in our positions here, no doubt. But that's why we took a position to monitor. Kind of a strong position, but, you know, if it's going to require a special session, if it doesn't get done before March 24th, it's going to require a uh, ballot measure from other groups, that's fine, or it's going to be a special session. We said it's time to man up. Director Odoricio. I, I appreciate those comments from Director Partridge, and I think that this is the first step to allowing it to get to the voters, and that's what I look forward to having is uh, this is the deal that will allow us to get exactly what I think you're looking for. Put it up for the voters to decide, and uh, this is the framework that will happen. So we're supportive of this. So I'll make one comment. Um, so I sit on the board of uh, Associated General Contractors of Colorado in my day job position, and we, we took a position on this this morning. We had our board meeting at 7 o'clock this morning. And um, you would think, obviously, intuitively, that a construction organ association would support this, and we did. However, AGC, the 95% of the members of AGC do vertical construction, not horizontal construction. So this doesn't directly benefit hardly out of the 519 member companies, it might benefit 10 of them maybe. Um, and not only did AGC Colorado take a position of support, they also um, took a position to throw $20,000 into, uh, into the fund to support it. So um, for what it's worth, the horizontal construction market in the state of Colorado is strongly supporting this. Excuse me, the vertical market. Yeah, vertical. Yeah. Of course, the, 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 the Colorado Contractors yeah. Association, of course. <laughs> Director Trular. We haven't had a motion yet. <laughs> we, we haven't. We haven't no. yet. I don't want to monitor it. I want to support it. Okay, we have a motion of support. <laughs> we have a motion and a second to support further discussion. All those in favor of the position of support, say aye. Aye. Opposed? No. Okay. Abstentions. Excuse me, abstentions, yes. Abstentions don't really matter. Yeah. Okay. The majority of those present. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Before we leave this topic. Can you use the mic, please? There, now I am. <laughs> I found it very hard to follow the discussion during this portion of our meeting, and I wonder if there's some way that we could get a handout on the night of the meeting that has all of the bills that were going to be presented to us in one place, because it's really hard trying to go back and forth between what we got in advance and what we got <laughs> when we came here. So. Is there a way we could we possibly get that? We can definitely do that. Thank you very much. I'm sorry. Yes. Two. Two opposed. All right. Very good. We got through it. Was that it, Rich? That is it. All right. Thank you. <laughs> What's that? Actually, there was one other question. Not to uh, cause m too much more discussion, but order, please. If we're go if we're supposing the bill, the question was since it's going to be heard in committee next Wednesday, 
do we want to have someone from Dr. Cog testify to that support? What? On what? <laughs> so, no. Order. <laughs> do you want to so, I have uh, a day job. <laughs> So the, so the question is whether or not, since we are taking a position of support, do we want a member of Dr. Cog board to be there to testify our support? Director Atchison is saying that he's going to be there anyway, and at, if the, at the board's direction, he would be happy to testify in support of this oh, bill. I move we send Director Atchison to testify in favor of this legislation. <laughs> second. We have a motion and a second that uh, Director I Atchison... All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? <laughs> Abstentions. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. All right. Agenda item 13, which is attachment G. Mr. Rex. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, the feds are in the house today. Tonight we have uh, Federal Highways and Federal Transit Administration representatives are present. And the reason why is because every four years, they're required to do a joint review of our planning process. And we were up in 2016. And uh, through the, the entire review process, we're now to the point of um, they wanted to present back to you all the review, uh, a, a review of their report that they did. And uh, without further ado, I know time is getting short. I'm going to turn it to, to Cindy. This mic's done. Well, there we go. Good evening, everyone. Um, so I'm just going to make a couple of brief introductory remarks, and then I'm going to turn it over to uh, Larry Squires of our staff. But I do want to say that it's great to be living back in Denver after 30 years. I lived here in 1988, and I interned for Warren Village. I'm sure you're all familiar with that. So it's great to be back after 30 years, and I've been on the ground about a month as the new regional administrator for the Federal Transit Administration. We cover six states here in the West. So I'm really looking forward to working with all of you and getting to know one of you and learning about um, all of the issues, the transportation planning issues that are affecting the Denver uh, metropolitan area. So I know you had a very successful planning certification review. I know everyone collaborated and communicated well and um, the staff is going to be presenting uh, the recommendations and um, all um, and uh, discussing all of the good things uh, that happened during that review. So I'm going to just let a, um, these gentlemen uh, introduce themselves. But again, I'm really glad to uh, be here in uh, Denver, Colorado. I'm looking forward to serving um, as your regional administrator. Please contact with contact me uh, or Federal Highway, uh, John Cater, Federal Highway. He's the division administrator with any concerns or questions you might have about transportation and transportation planning and the federal role and any funding concerns that you may have. And so I will turn it over to these fine gentlemen to introduce themselves. Hi, I'm Bill Haas. I'm with Federal Highway, Highway Administration in the Colorado Division Office. I'm the program development team leader and Aaron Busto on my team sitting back here was um, our lead um, person for the review um, and I'll turn it over to Darren. Uh, Darren Allen, I'm the Director of Planning and Program Development for FTA, Federal Transit Administration. I just wanted to just a note of kudos to the staff of uh, Dr. Cog. Working with them has been a real pleasure. I came from the New York area working with the MPO in the New York uh, metro area there. And uh, I, it's a real pleasure, again, to work with Doug and his, uh, his staff here. <laughs> so thank you very much. And uh, Larry, I take it away. Larry, you're in good hands with Larry here, right here. Thank you, Darren. Uh, good evening. Good evening, Chair, uh, the board. Uh, I'm here to present the joint FHWA-FTA planning certification review process report uh, and findings. Uh, you, you've just heard from uh, Bill at FHWA and Aaron at FHWA as well as Darren at FTA Region 8 and on behalf of FTA Region 8 and FHWA uh, thank you for the welcome this evening uh, and allowing us the opportunity to come and provide 
our uh, report and findings with you. Bill and Aaron and Darren did most of the heavy lifting, so it's altogether fitting that they put me to task this evening to present to you. Uh, and with that, we'll get right into it. I'll try to be respectful of your time. We're all feeling a little horizontal right now, Mr. <laughs> Chair. So, uh, Really, I'm, I'm going to go over the planning certification review process in brief. Uh, and again, uh, reiterate and emphasize the determination of certification. Uh, there were no corrective actions within our Dr. Cog certification review and report. Uh, and then I'll just go over a few of the findings and resolutions. Uh, so a little of basis uh, behind the planning certification review. The FHWA and FTA are required to jointly review the metropolitan planning process every four years for transportation management areas and provide a determination if the process meets the requirements of federal law and regulations that uh, that process within the Dr. Cog in this instance, uh, metropolitan area, uh, TMA, uh, is compliant with the federal planning requirements. Uh, and those outcomes are certified and, and, or, or partially certified in the event that y'all might have missed the mark or uh, not to be certified at all if we found a lot of corrective actions. Again, that wasn't the case here, and I want to reiterate and emphasize that uh, you know, we have n uh, nothing but good things to say about Dr. Cog, uh, and, and really it, it's difficult in, in coming to uh, the Cog, and you might have gleaned this from our previous report and looking at the numerous pages of commendations, uh, you know, to try to find a place to limit that uh, and, and not rehash the same thing. And, and, and uh, I'm reminded of a saying that, you know, uh, we often stop at knowing the good without doing it because we also know the better and we cannot do that or we're unable to do that. And uh, in asking us to come present tonight, uh, Dr. Cog asked us to present the findings and, and we, we were a little remiss. We forgot to include the commendations in our uh, our, our overview here this evening, and, and that's because we just want you to continue to strive to do the better. <laughs> uh, this is a, a little screenshot of that planning certification review process where we started with a desktop review, uh, and we completed that as well as a questionnaire by January uh, and, and came into a site visit in February with Dr. Cog and their planning partners, the Colorado Department of Transportation, the regional uh, Transit Department District, uh, excuse me, RTD. Again, we're feeling a little horizontal right now. Uh, we had public meetings and comments after that site visit in March, and we developed over the course of a summer a report and issued a transmittal letter of certification uh, determination uh, in October before the report came out because we knew that we had no corrective actions and, and we wanted to take a little bit more time to uh, coordinate uh, our findings uh, and vet them through the process. Uh, the determination of certification, of course, in October uh, was a letter signed by both FHWA and FTA Region 8 that certified Dr. Cog MPO as being in compliance with federal planning regulations uh, and provides four years of continued operation. These are the areas, not necessarily the finding areas, these are the areas of review. Uh, and as you see, they're, they're quite extensive. Uh, there's 20 plus, there's a lot of sub areas and, and categories. Uh, you've seen a few of these areas tonight. We review the planning documentation, the long range transportation plan, as well as the transportation improvement plan, and all of the process that goes into that, the public involvement process as part of that. Uh, and and the findings occurred in, of these 20 plus areas, the uh, five or six areas, agreements and contracts, financial planning, public outreach, self-certifications, the congestion management process, security in the planning process, and travel demand forecasting and modeling. And I'll go into those here briefly. Uh, the, the financial uh, planning finding, and you'll find all of the report in uh, the section 13, I'm, I'm not sure what appendices it was, uh, but there's also a table around page four if you wanted to walk through this with me. Uh, the financial plan finding, it, it, it really looked at revising the 2040 financial plan uh, in, in finalizing it, and in doing so, moving into the 2045 financial plan, 
uh, in the development of the next long-range plan, looking at those inflation factors and revenue and cost assumptions, uh, and, and really moving into the 2045 financial pl uh, plan to provide a foundation for funding sources and cost projections and uh, consistent financial representations across all of your transportation planning processes and planning documentation. Uh, our planning agreements finding, uh, and, and this was being worked on, I might add, as we were moving through the process, but because it wasn't finalized, it was uh, something that we, we wanted to contribute a little bit to, uh, and really to look at uh, better documentation of a cooperative development of the estimated revenue and costs in concert with the financial plan review that we had provided. Security in the planning process is something that, quite frankly, all MPOs really struggle with. And our finding in this regard was one in which we, we looked to Dr. Cog to start to identify, identify their role uh, in providing security in the planning process uh, and, and really outlining those roles and responsibilities in the MPO in terms of emergency events and resiliency. Public participation plan, we uh, asked Dr. Cog to evaluate the effectiveness of their public participation procedures and strategies, uh, look to include performance measures in the development of their public participation plan that evaluate the effectiveness of the outreach and the feedback to understand how the public is receiving the information and really to provide direction on successful strategies and eliminate strategies that are unsuccessful moving forward. Uh, this is stemming from that somewhat, uh, somewhat related, and it really gets to some of the mobility that was discussed. And I, I have to say, in listening to the comments provided earlier, we were quite pleased in doing our review uh, in, in finding uh, that coordinated transit human uh, development plan a part of the vision uh, and the long-range planning for the Dr. Cog area. And in looking at that, we really wanted to, to, to step a little bit behind that. A, again, a, a previous commendation for Dr. Cog was really rising to the challenge of, of performing high. Uh, and, and this is one of those cases, uh, like a lot of these findings, where we're looking for explicit procedures and strategies and outcomes for seeking out and considering the needs of those traditionally underserved. And they did a good deal of that in their coordinated plan, uh, but looking to, how, to see how the planning process is effectively uh, meeting those needs uh, with these pr procedures and strategies and identifying those in the public participation plan. The self-certification uh, and ADA uh, finding that was in there w was really something new, and this is kind of a, it, it's a, a something like security that the MPOs are, are not necessarily conversant with. We looked for Dr. Cog to pro uh, provide a, an, an ADA program access plan that really includes the self-evaluation and demonstrating and addressing barriers and public coordination with the stakeholders. Uh, and, and FHWA is working uh, with Dr. Cog and really moving that forward uh, in concert with the Colorado Department of Transportation. And our next finding was regarding the congestion management plan. And again, a lot like the public participation plan, uh, it, it, it really, uh, it's an extensive document. Uh, and, and we just look for areas of improvement to the CMP that include reporting impacts of implemented projects and demonstrating the relationship, again, between the strategies, the effectiveness, and the performance objectives. Travel demand modeling, and, and, and when we spoke in our previous certification review to really rising to the challenge of high performance, uh, n nowhere better is it uh, really indicated than in the travel demand modeling uh, Dr. Cog ha has evidence of extensive data source contributions uh, when updating and forming their focus model. And the activity-based model is really something that a, a lot of uh, high-performing MPOs are, are struggling with right now. Uh, and we really just look for some, there's a lot of uh, funding that goes to the a lot of time and energy, and we're seeing a lot of efficiencies uh, and a lot of effectiveness from these plans. Uh, especially with regards to air quality conformity. Uh, we'd look for uh, a little bit more documentation on how 
the calibration and validation process occurs uh, and what the results of that calibration and validation process are. And that really sums up the findings. Uh, I, I, we want to talk to the, the, the resolution of those findings, though, and the identification of reasonable measures for timely completion of the findings. And we've already begun uh, you know, down the road of resolving the findings. Dr. Cog was engaged, uh, uh, as well as their planning partners, CDOT uh, and, and RTD, during the planning certification review. Uh, and because of this, it might be what prolonged a little bit of the, the activity between summer and spring. We were looking to, and, and we did make a lot of progress with these, and we struggled with including some of these findings or removing them. Uh, but they've, they've made substantial uh, advancements in really resolving a lot of these activities uh, and, and moving forward. And I know FHWA and FTA have been here uh, to assist as, as, to the maximum extent practicable, uh, and, and our, we look forward to uh, continued involvement in the regional planning process uh, in the provision of that technical assistance and active participation. And if there's any questions, uh, you can contact either myself, I'm, again, I'm Larry Squires with FTA Region 8, or Aaron Busto with FHWA Colorado Division. and. Uh, you know, be, being respectful and mindful of the, the time uh, and where you are in the process, we would open it up for questions if... Questions or comments? Director, or Mr. X. Thank you, sir, very much. Uh, no, I, I just wanted to say that, you know, we, we do take these recommendations very seriously. Um, you know, it's all about, as Larry said, it's all about improving, making this process better. And um, as he also su suggests, that we are already well on our way with, uh, with implementing a lot of those recommendations. And by the end of the year, we'll probably have them all done. So, uh, so but just so you all know, we have a tremendous working relationship with our federal partners. And it's not a big brother thing by any means. It's a true partnership. And, and we feel comfortable any time reaching out to them, knowing that we're going to get the, the proper respect and, and, quite frankly, the answers or direction that we need on, on, on uh, particular issues. That, has, that is not always the case. I've been to several places now, and uh, I must say that the staff at both F FTA and FHWA are tremendous here. So this is an informational item only, no action necessary. Oh, uh, any, other, any questions or comments at all? Seeing none, thank you very much. Appreciate the presentation. Agenda item 14, which is attachment H, Mr. X. Um, all righty. I, I, um, I won't, certainly won't belabor this. Last month, you all recall that uh, the board took action to, um, to allow the uh, TIP review work group, or now the TIP policy work group, to um, continue to explore the dual model as we fill out our, our TIP policy document in anticipation of our next call for projects, which will be in 2018. And um, it was requested at the uh, board work session as well as I think it was reiterated at the board meeting itself that uh, you all would like to have a schedule of when certain topics might come back to the board. Um, and I, I, I was, would like to say that, of course, this is, this is fluid. I mean, this was our best guess at the time when, we, when the work group got together. Um, but I would anticipate that the first thing that you will see um, and I'm, I'm referring to attachment one right now within this, within this agenda item, um, that we will first bring back to you, we'll have a general discussion about focus areas, priority areas that you all want to want to focus on uh, for the next TIP call. We'll bring that to the, to the May board work session, as well as we'll have a discussion about the regional pot or the regional share and, and some, of the, uh, some of the issues and uh, complexities of that that we'd like to get your discussion on. So. Um, I, without, I mean, I, if you have any questions about this, I'd be happy to answer. It's a uh, it's pretty compact timeline, you might, might notice. Um, it was certainly, we were well aware of it when we were trying to fill it out because we were trying to get to a point um, of having a TIP policy document approved by December of 2017 so we could initiate the regional call for projects in the first quarter of 2018. So um, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer. So this, again, is an informational item only with no action necessary. However, if there are any questions or comments, we'll open up for that. Seeing none, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Agenda item 15 is committee reports. Stack.
Director Jones. All righty. Um, the stack had a, a lunch with the Transportation Commission in mid-February. It was very positive, a lot of talk about trying to increase communication between STAC and the TC per the legislation that passed. We decided we would do, get together more often, and so the next meeting is in July. Um, at the February meeting of the STAC, we heard a lot of updates on a number of things. I think of uh, the, the items that were be of most interest to Dr. Cog was the update on the Alt Fuels program. As you recall, $30 million of CMAC money that usually goes through Dr. Cog was sent to um, the Colorado Energy Office and the RAC to fund the Alt Fuels program. About half of that's been spended on, spent on either vehicles or charging stations to date. And with the VW settlement monies, there will be a lot more action, I think, on the electric vehicle side, including um, NREL is going to be completing an electric vehicle corridor study by, the, by I think, April that will help us sort of pinpoint where we need to add charging stations to maximize the use of any of the VW settle money, settlement monies that come to Colorado. And then last but not least, um, there was a lot of discussion on the National Highway Freight Program, which is a new um, uh, funding program under the FAST Act, the Federal FAST Act, that will send about $15 million annually to Colorado. So there was a lot of discussion on funding scenarios and project selection. Thank you. Metro Mayor's Caucus, Director Atchison. Mr. Chairman, the uh, Metro Mayor's Executive Committee has continued to follow the construction litigation and transportation issues, and that's where we are spending a big part of our time working mostly those items. Metro Area County Commissioners, Director Partridge. We met uh, last week. We were in Boulder, actually. And we had a presentation from the, the Boulder County Sheriff, excellent presentation. And uh, I got to remember what it was on. <laughs> mental health. Okay, it was a whole combination of mental health. Really you know, good. You know. <laughs> so it was on mental health. It was a combination with uh, our county, actually, on the other mental health side, on some of the mental health initiative that we're working on. And, uh, you know, very innovative program to go forward because we certainly are seeing the impact of mental health on our communities on all levels, whether it's going to be emergency rooms because of the, when a call is made, there is something that certainly has to be done if it's a mental health issue. Sometimes it does go to ER. Sometimes it's a mental health hold in the jail. Many times it's not a criminal action that's occurring, but sometimes that's what has to occur if they are taken to the jails. So we are working on a very innovative program trying to uh, work with uh, uh, fire, mental health, and uh, law enforcement. So when we get a mental health call, those three entities actually are on the call and a determination is made. Is it a legal issue, is it a mental health issue, or is it really a, a true health issue at that time? So with that, we're doing analytics on it. We really believe there's going to be a large cost savings. Because when you look at, we had looked at five different case studies, and we are in the hundreds of thousands of dollars just with five case studies over a short number of years. Now that is all, sometimes that's tax dollars, sometimes that's insurance dollars. So some really exciting things coming out of that, but it's really great cooperation between fire, police, and mental health. Thank you. Director Graves. You got one mic for that end of the table. <laughs> I know. So just a quick compliment to Douglas County. They really are doing some innovative things in this space. And I want to share something very briefly that the City and County of Denver is beginning to do. We're actually now having mental health professionals right along with Denver Police Department vehicles. And because given the number of contacts that we're having with the same population over and over again, we're actually realizing a great deal of benefit. Thank you. Great. I'll just Director say Brockett. That, sorry, the City of Boulder is doing that too and having great success. Director Odorisu. Well, since we're all bragging about things, uh, we're, we're uh, investing in the uh, mental health wing of the jail in Adams County, creating an actual mental health wing in the jail to capture, not uh, capture is a bad term, <laughs> to, <laughs> to, to, engage, to engage folks that are there for the reasons that we don't want them to return. So. <laughs> all right, very good. Advisory Committee on Aging, Jayla Sanchez-Warren. 
Thank you. So the Advisory Committee on Aging uh, spent some time getting ready for a Senior Day at the Capitol. The Senior Day at the Capitol was today. It was well attended with about uh, 400 folks uh, there. Very exciting. Um, you know what was the most exciting? And, and Doug knows this. I have to tell him, Doug. Um, <laughs> the Area Agency on Aging was mentioned seven times by legislators. Nice. Um, that's never, I have been going to Senior Day at the Capitol for over 20 years, and it has never happened before. And several times they said the Dr. Cog Area Agency on Aging. Woohoo! Um, that's really good news. Um, you know, saying that our partnership with the with the Denver Regional Council of Governments Area Agency on Aging is really important to us, and that's great. I give Rich and the lobbying team, um, Ed and Jen, a lot of credit for that. But you know what else? We have two former board members that are now at the Colorado Legislature, Beth, Beth Humanic and Rachel Zinzinger, and they are champions for us. So I would encourage you all, if you all want to go up to that level, you uh, please do, because um, it's really benefiting us. Um, <laughs> we also had a, a complex... Uh, a, a detailed report on the uh, long-term care ombudsman program. For those of you who are new, this is a program that protects the health, safety, wel welfare, and rights of people that live in nursing homes and assisted living facilities. We have almost 500 in the metropolitan area uh, facilities, and our ombudsmen are awesome. They talked about um, Shannon Gimbel, who's the director of the ombudsman program, the program manager gave some program stats. They investigated over 2,000 complaints last year. Uh, they made over 5,000 visits um, and a number of consultations and trainings, et cetera. They talked about the top complaints in nursing homes and assisted living. The top, the number one complaint in both are involuntary discharges. And then the second complaint is healthcare health related. Um, not enough staff in nursing homes and medication errors in assisted living facilities. So it's a big job and um, that's what we're trying to do is highlight a program that we run here at Dr. Cog uh, at the Aging Advisory Committee and take a deeper dive. We talked a lot about legislation. Uh, construction litigation affects uh, a lot of seniors in the sense that a lot of the affordable housing bills have not gone through because people are saying we're not going to do anything on affordable housing until the construction litigation gets passed. So we're very interested in that. Uh, the committee was very excited about 1242, the transportation bill, and the multi modal component of it, that is awesome. Um, getting people where, where they want to go, when they want to get there is really important. We can go from survive transportation to hopefully thrive. Right now, our transportation focuses a lot on you know, just getting people to doctor's offices. The, the transportation that we fund out of the AAA um, focuses on getting people to doctor's offices and to meals um, and food, grocery stores. Um, and we can't do much beyond that because the, the demand is so high. Then, of course, all the human services bills. We talked a lot about the federal issues that are going on. The, the potential changes to Medicare is a big concern. The potential changes um, to Medicaid, block granting, Medicaid, and what that means for Colorado and our older citizens, as well as um, the Older Americans Act, which of course we're very involved in because that's where we get our authority. Um, it, because it's a non-defense discretionary program, there could be um, impacts to our program. And uh, there's a lot of talk about sequestration coming back. Uh, so we're watching that very closely. Uh, we also talked about no copay radio and no copay radio is a is a program now we're calling it ncpr doesn't that sound fun uh, i mean wow we just got more sophisticated um it's expanded uh, it's it's uh 14 30 a.m uh on the dial cruising radio it, it has expanded from Saturday at 4.30 p.m. to also now 7 a.m. on Sunday, and Herb heard it uh, last week. Oh, she was really uh, there, and it turned out it was a tape. Oh, come on. <laughs> you told me, do you have a life? <laughs> <laughs> Um, this is a program that we sponsor because the whole goal is trying to get information and resources to people. It, it pains me every time I hear somebody say, gosh, I wish I would have known about the AAA when, you know, my mom had these problems. Or I wish 
I would have known about the AAA when my dad had to go to a nursing home. Uh, I had no idea. And with all these changes, it's really important to get as much information as possible. So please, please, please listen. If you get a chance, listen to that program because we give a lot of good information. We're going to be talking. Our host or our guest tomorrow is um, uh, uh, Bob Murphy, who's now the used to be the mayor of Lakewood and now is the Colorado president of AARP. So he's going to talk about the changes in the potential changes, the proposed changes in Medicare. For a half an hour. He's getting a whole half an hour on that. Director Atchison. Yeah, just uh, from a personal note, uh, I will tell you, talking to Jayla and her team and having referred people to her and her team to do the investigation, what you will get from a sales brochure or a salesperson at a nursing home, an assisted living center, tells you one story. Call Jayla. If you're talking about friends, your own personal relatives, you will find out there are many cases. There's a whole different story of the reviews that they do and the personal contact they have on site. Don't make a bad decision. Call them. You may find out something that's very supportive of the decision you're making, but it also could keep you from making a very big mistake. Yeah, remember we're a resource for you. That's what we're here for. So if you have an issue with a family member or a friend, please call us. We want to help you. Um, do the best you can for those folks. So I will only point out that most local elected officials would consider the state legislature a step down, but... Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay. So if you want to take a step down... <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Jayla. <laughs> so the RAC, um, Shakti's not here, Elise or Herb? No report. Uh, E-470, Director Rakowski. Since our last uh, meeting here, E-470 had its uh, strategic plan meeting at which uh, Director Partridge and Director Williams acquitted themselves fantastically. <laughs> <laughs> Report on fast tracks, Bill Van Meter. So this will be a short report in, the, in their last meeting of the planning capital programs and fast tracks committee the board did not have any subst substantive action items or informational items briefings related to fast tracks so i have nothing to report i would like to insert a quick thank you for doug he referenced it earlier in his executive report that um, he is serving on RTD's past program working group. That's going to be a relatively significant commitment and effort on his part, and RTD appreciates that um, anticipated year-long effort. Thank you. So I'll just quickly mention that um, Aurora opened the R line a couple of weeks ago, 60 and 70 degree days every day except for that day. <laughs> when it was 18 degrees <laughs> Eight, 18 degrees it was interesting because they had tents with no heaters in them and people standing around eating breakfast burritos with you know their breath <laughs> yeah yeah it was it was interesting all right a few informational items and administrative items um for for your purview the next meeting is april 19th 2017 any other matters by members? Seeing none, we are adjourned. <laughs>